Majority Report with Sam Cedar, where every day is casual Friday. That means Monday is casual Monday, Tuesday, casual Tuesday, Wednesday, casual hump day, Thursday, casual Thurs, that's what we call it, and Friday, casual Shabbat, the Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, December 20th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, it's the final casual Friday of 2019 and arguably the decade, although that argument would be wrong. We will get into that. Probably we'll spend the whole show talking about that. That's great. Joining us on the program, Heather Parton, or as you may know her, Digby from the blog Hullabaloo and Salon.com. Also on the program today, from his eBay account, and from the forcing senior citizens to it? watch Ridgewood? terrifying he... dystopian movies about incest that are really about capitalism. The, the uh, a Queens based JCC right. learning annex. I can't remember where where it's located. He made exactly. us watch this but, Dutch film about a brother and sister, but. With a very prestigious announcement about the film he's been working on. Fantastic. Matthew Film Guy. Finally. Will be with us. Also on the program, wrap up of the Democratic debate. Everyone sees Buttigieg's reflection on the wine cave wall. I hope you know your Nietzsche and your uh, Plato. Plato. Well, I know it from Thus Spake Zara's Truth stuff. So it's... Dad, I'm, I'm really friggin' Zarathustra. I know it from the cask of Amontillado. Uh, easy for Zarathustra to say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Trump reportedly told aides that he knows it was Ukraine that interfered in the 2016 election because his best bud, Pooty Poot, told him so. It's being reported. Mick, Mul- Mick Mulvaney reportedly flying the coop. Is it possible Mark Meadows really wants that job? And the House and Senate pass a $1.4 trillion spending bill averting a shutdown. And congrats, it's full of huge giveaways to the medical industry and pharmaceutical industry, including the one that... um, the lawmakers were so proud of stripping from the U.S. Uh, the U.S. the new NAFTA program. I'm, I'm, I can't say. Get it while you can. Uh, meanwhile, SCOTUS will hear two cases on whether religious organizations will have broad ability to ignore civil rights laws in terms of their employees. Congress passes a 401k reform, non reform. That will make brokers richer and puts lie to the complaints about college debt forgiveness. New Georgia temporary senator vows to fight the impeachment sham, though it's unclear which part of the impeachment she believes is a sham. The sham part. Virginia Zoo shows how Trump's degraded USDA or how degraded Trump's USDA has become. And lastly, uh, Trump uh, battles new sanctions on Russia. Because all this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us on what is the final live program of 2019. Uh, Although I I will be... um, Hopping on uh, YouTube uh, on and off during the vacation, 
And I will also uh, will be doing the AM quickie, although it may be a slightly um, variant, v- varied version of it. Um, I think may do it a little more casually, may record it through the phone, may do it while I'm making eggs. I'm not sure what's, what's going to happen. Don't tempt them. What's that? Don't tease them. Don't. Yes. People want to watch you making eggs. So well, bad. no, no, that will not be the AM quickie is just audio only. Yeah. You'll just be able to hear the sizzle. That's right. You'll just be able to or or the scramble, whatever it's going to be, or maybe the boil. Who Some knows? Real ASMR. Exactly. Um, you can uh, you can sign up for the AM quickie, which we would encourage you to do. It is completely free. It is simply a podcast subscription. And uh, you can you can do that through amquickie.com. You can do it on Stitcher. You can do it on. Sp- I don't know if it's on Spotify. That's a good question. You can do it on iTunes. We should look into that. But um, certainly you can go uh, subscribe to it there or you can just pick up the uh, Majority Report app and find it on the app if you want. But uh, it's always good to subscribe to both programs, both free versions of uh, the free version of the Majority Report and the um, the AM Quickie through a, you know, uh, iTunes or something like that, even if you tend to listen to it on the app, because it helps our numbers and um, and, and brings in new people, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, just a reminder at the end of the year, uh, that it's uh, your support that has made this show possible, not just for this year, and I want to say the decade, but in fact, it's only been nine years of the decade. In fact, really, it will be uh, the decade when this show has its 10th anniversary, because we all know that uh, the world did not start, or our calendar did not start in the year zero, started in the year one of the common era, as we like to say, so when a little we're bit Jewish. of Ben Shapiro energy. What? Yeah. I don't know. I just the the real precision about these dates. Yeah. I think Tell it to say Stephen J. Gould. Time is so short. Oh, you know what? You're buddy. right. All right. All right. Buddy. I take it back. Stephen J. Oh, Gould's Stephen the best. J. Gould said Stephen, it must yes, be right. Exactly. Right. Okay. It, precisely. I, so, I I'm conceding fully the point. I, I actually think it it deserves an apology, not to me. I apologize but to, to Stephen the, J. To Gould the, for comparing the of Stephen J. Gould. I, I am so. Uh, I, well, anyway, actually, a lot of people. I'm Stephen with Jaden Smith. <laughs> time's not real. The point, uh, regardless That's of, the of all insight. the questions about time, uh, the uh, this show exists because of your support. And you um, uh, I want to thank uh, those of you who become members. Encourage those of you who uh, enjoy this show and uh, think you're going to enjoy it in 2020, which should be a real um, crap show of a year. As it it's were. It's going to be a real humding. Oh, my God. Uh, join the Majority Report.com. Join the Majority Report.com. There you can go check it out, become a member. All right. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, some uh, debate roundup today when we have Digby on. I mean, theoretically, we could talk, look back on the decade. The problem is, is that um, I don't think that we could even look back on. The last three weeks uh, sufficiently. So we're not going to do the traditional year end review thing. I think maybe in January, um, I think uh, I'm going to have uh, Perrine come on. Maybe we'll, do, we'll we'll look back on stuff. I think that's the way we did it last year, actually, now that I think about it or something to that effect. And I think it's much more effective because you get so many of the look back on stuff. And really, the first week of January is really the time where you should look back on stuff. Well, that way you can review the look the reviews of the decade too you can review the reviews of the decade and it's also you don't have that thing like well how come nobody ever talks about like the 31st that always gets lost or the 30th the 29th nobody talks about those days because everybody's done the review of the year it's deep dude uh we also have some great great best ofs in fact you might say they're the best of 2019 that we've compiled for you under the auspices of our best of shows uh, over the next uh, week, and, week and a half, uh, some stuff is funny. A lot of the stuff is super interesting. Some of it's really just um, uh, cracked dry, that dry. I mean, like just cracked earth dry, right? Um, but no, yeah, I think you'll enjoy it. All right, let's get to um, – it's hard to say what the, the biggest takeaway be, uh, of the debate was last night because I think, frankly, there was a couple. I have a feeling that 
you know, you, you generally get those debates where it's like one person pops and nothing else happens. But I have a feeling like there's a bunch of people going a bunch of different directions after this. And um, I, uh, you know, I think our, our, our quick response uh, analysis more or less was correct last night. But I get this, uh, you know, having spent uh, the night to marinate it, I'm feeling like Pete Buttigieg might have taken a much more of a beating than um, I, I think even we thought that he had last night, even though that we did. And it came at the hands of a couple of different people. But I think the the worst one might be from Amy Klobuchar because of the nature of it which was striking at not just his electability, but really like, like how are you, what are you doing up on this stage, dude? Like, because let's remember, he has completely abandoned his interesting proposal on court packing. Not just the proposal was interesting, but the impetus to do it signified to people like this is a guy who's not going to be constrained by, you know, tradition and norms and understands that we're in the midst of a knife fight and he's willing to bring, you know, a knife to a knife fight or a gun, bat, whatever. But he's completely abandoned that. And remember, part of the interest in this guy at the beginning was he's for Medicare for all. And so he was bringing new ideas to the fore, but he abandoned all those things and basically became a young version of Joe Biden. I can bring the country together. I am um, I I am electable because of where I've been and I'm young. So I have all the things that you love about Joe Biden. With a lot less specificity, <laughs> no experience, but youth. And that's important because, you know, young people are younger than older people. So uh, and but Amy Klobuchar basically decided to uh, go right at him, basically on the topic of, A, you're not electable. and B, you haven't done really much. Are you guys hand up? Harkening back, I made my case on immigration to what the mayor said um, about Washington. So I look at this a different way. When we were in the last debate, Mayor, uh, you uh, basically mocked uh, the hundred years of experience on the stage. And what do I see on this stage? I see Elizabeth's work starting the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and helping 29 million people. I see the vice president's work in getting uh, $2 billion for his cancer moonshot. I see Senator Sanders' work of working to get the veterans bill passed across the aisle. And I see what I've done, uh, which is to negotiate three farm bills and be someone that actually had major provisions put in those bills. So while you can dismiss committee hearings, I think this experience works. And I have not denigrated your experience as a local official. I have been one. You know, I just think you should I'm respect sorry. our experience when you look at how you evaluate someone who can get things done. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Mayor, I'll give now you Now pause it for one second. Here's the thing that, uh, and I don't think most voters pick up on this, but, but, uh, I do on some level. I, I have a background in theater. Um, Buttigieg has a tell that he's about to go. Whenever he's cornered on anything, he's going to go right to his military service and make it about putting his life on the line. Remember now, all the Klobuchar has done now is maybe there's a slight little denigration in terms of like, you've just done local stuff, but we've done stuff that have helped millions of people. That's her pitch. Watch how defensive he gets as if he's being as if his service is being. Attacked. Can I just say, I thought this was bad while I was watching it. It's worse. An order of magnitude worse rewatching what? it. You actually did denigrate my experience, Senator, and it was before the break and I was going to let it go because we got bigger fish to fry here. But you implied oh, I don't that think we have bigger fish you... to fry than picking a president of the United States. <laughs> You're right. That's good again. Savage. And before the break, you seem to imply that my relationship to the First Amendment was a talking point. As if anyone up here has any more or less commitment to the Constitution than anybody else up here. 
Let me tell you about my relationship to the First Amendment. It is part of the Constitution that I raised my right hand and swore to defend with my life. That is my experience, and it may not be the same as yours, but it counts, Senator. It counts. Uh, thank, thank you, you Mr. Mayor. Senator Kobus, you have 45 been, seconds to respond. I certainly respect your military experience. That's not what this is about. This is about choosing a president. And I know uh, my view of this is I know you ran for to be chair of the Democratic National Committee. That's not something that I wanted to do. I want to be president of the United States. And the point is we should have someone heading up this ticket that has actually won and been able to show that they can gather the support that you talk about of moderate Republicans and independents, as well as a fired up Democratic base. And not just done it once. I have done it three times. I think winning matters. I think a track record of getting things done matters. And I also think showing our party that we can actually bring people with us, have a wider tent, have a bigger coalition, and yes, longer coattails, that matters. Thank you, Senator. Denise. Oh, excuse me. I got to respond to that. I got to respond to that. No. Senator, I, I know that, that if you just go by vote totals, maybe what goes on in my city seems small to you. If you want to talk about the capacity to win, try putting together a coalition to bring you back to office with 80 percent of the vote as a gay dude in Mike Pence's Indiana. Pause it for one second. Now, I, the just to be clear, he got eighty five hundred votes. So he put together this coalition and got 80% of the vote. Uh, presumably the whole vote was about what? I don't know, 10,500? In a right? liberal college town. In a liberal college town. But he stitched together a coalition of 8,500 people. Now, there were tech incubators. I have. There were racist cops. Some of my parents' friends in the uh, faculty community. I stitched that coalition together. I want to say this, that um, I understand what a monumental achievement that is. Because when I ran for student government president, <laughs> and, but, and when I ran as uh, treasurer of the uh, senior year class at Doherty uh, High, Doherty Memorial High School in Worcester, I had to stitch together a, a coalition of people that uh, brought me about 90% of the votes, which was close to 1,300 votes. And now that's no 8,500 votes, <laughs> but I get the dynamic. I think without, I just want to say, without campaigning, every single one of us on the, in this room have gotten, along with uh, several Cometown cast members, a multitude of write-in votes for local offices that's in true. Brooklyn. That's yeah. true. And we've pulled that coalition together without even actively campaigning. That's true. But but uh, there's a reason why he says 80% of the vote as opposed to 8,500 votes. 8,500 votes, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there's, there's almost that many people in attendance at this Democratic debate. But, but uh, here is where Klobuchar says, you know what? If you're going to put that out there, guess what I'm going to do? To bring you back to office with 80 percent of the vote as a gay dude in Mike Pence's Indiana. <laughs> Pence had 40 percent approval rating, incidentally. But for that. If you had won in Indiana, that would be one thing. You tried and you lost by 20 points. But let's talk about how we win. Excuse me. Let's talk Burn. about it. Well, By the way, that was fact check. Did you now, read the yeah, fact check on that? Yes, there is a fact check on that. Um, uh, she is referring to his statewide treasury run. And she got that wrong, to be fair. He lost uh, by 27% of the vote. <laughs> He lost to a guy named Richard Murdoch. And think about this. When he talks about how great it was that he was able to win in South Bend in Mike Pence's uh, Indiana. Uh, the reality is, is that not only did Richard Murdoch beat him by 27 percent, but after serving this is in 2010, after serving as a treasurer for two years, Murdoch decided to run against Joe Donnelly in 2012 and lost by 6%. So <laughs> there's no perfect way to measure this, but Pete Buttigieg is so far away from where winning a statewide office, and it wasn't just because he was a Democrat. 
Joe Donnelly beat the guy who beat Buttigieg by 27 percent, beat him by 6 percent after that guy had been in state office for two years. So the Buttigieg, whole brand is a, is just it's it's uh, fraudulent. I mean, well, I, you know, I mean, I'm sorry. I, and I just want to say, I look, I don't really care on some level if he was still running on court packing and so on. And he was just a mayor, then I would. Great. You know, whatever. Like, there's a limit to how much I want to beat up on him for just being a small town mayor. However, his book, his pack, his language is this like, I have a special connection with the Midwest electorate. And the only reason he's well, doing this delusional run is because yeah. he cannot win statewide in Indiana. That is the, the point I was trying to make it at the top was like, all he has left is this electability argument. And, and the thing is, is it like, look, I didn't know, I didn't know the specifics of this. And I'm quite convinced that if I didn't know the specifics of this, most of the people in the press did not know the specifics of it. And I can assure you that today they all know. And so when Pete Buttigieg tries to make this claim, and that's why I think um, this is one of those instances where the debate was like particularly painful and going to be disturbed, you know, hard for him. I think other people may have shifted up and down. We can talk about that more with Digby. But uh, I think Pete Buttigieg... I think is um, if Pete Buttigieg starts to drop, I think now anyways, this is that moment and this debate will have been the moment that Pete Buttigieg went away. And good for Amy Klobuchar. Like I can see how he would be legitimately annoying to her because she is to some degree a self-made woman. As I understand it, she had kind of a difficult childhood growing up with an alcoholic for a dad And she's very honest about what she believes. And, you know, I don't agree with the things she believes, but she's honest. And then she sees this little twerp coming in, like saying he's for Medicare for all, pivoting left and right. Like, it's time for her to spank him like his mom never did. I had a conversation with... Or like she does to her staff. I had a conversation with, off the record conversation with a a candidate who dropped out of the race. There's a lot of them, so it's not, I'm not going to say who it is and uh, you won't know. And they said, um, uh, the one thing they said is that he believes nothing. At least that's the thinking of the other candidates, that Pete Buttigieg believes in nothing. Uh, And I think that's that's coming out. And I think that's a good thing, uh, frankly. I'm happy to see that. Um, Where am I? Okay. Oh, before we go uh, to Digby. Oh, I should tell you this. All right. Look, you've spent a lot of money to make your home beautiful. Maybe you haven't spent a lot of money to make your home beautiful. But you don't want to let it to go, go to waste without good lighting. And frankly, you can get away with not spending a lot of money on uh, your apartment with good lighting. In other words, you don't have to have the greatest uh, furniture. But lighting creates the, um, the sense of the space. Bottom line. Lamps Plus has been helping customers love their everyday spaces for over 40 years. They got chandeliers, they got ceiling lights, they got table lamps, they got more. The light itself is like jewelry for the home. Uh, I, I, I mean, frankly, I don't think it's just an accoutrement. <laughs> Lamps Plus is uh, the nation's largest lighting retailer. It has over 55,000 designs from top brands and their own exclusive designs in lighting, home furnishing, and decor. You don't have to guess at what the designs are going to look like. You don't have to wander around a uh, big box store. Lamp Plus has videos with design tips and all the photos on their site to tell you which light fixtures or furniture pieces are featured. It's easy to buy what you like. They also have a large selection of Minka Laveri lights, Laveri lights, uh, lighting, uh, which, which transforms your home into like wonderful living spaces. Minka Laveri is known for designs that blend function and style using innovative materials. Um, I got a very sort of like sleek, you know, my whole style is I like it functional and I like it clean, clean lines. That's the way I go for it. Mid-century modern type of look, that's where I'm at. But I'm also a very functional person. I don't know if people have come, I don't think that, that comes across. What sense are you using the word functional? I mean, I, for me, functionality, <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, functionality is very important uh, okay. to me. Functionality uh, is very okay, important, there we go. right? Like I set up my whole, uh, you know, I get everything is within my arm's reach at any given point. 
Um, I got a lamp, has a USB plug and a regular outlet on it, but it's discreet. You can't really see it until you you know you plug it in. It's a perfect. Um, uh, I could use it as a uh, night, uh, like a bedside lamp, or I could use it as a table lamp. I happen to use it as a, a, a you know like a night light type of thing. Uh, right now, you can get up to 50% off of hundreds of lights, furniture, and decor between November 25th and de- December 24th. We're right in the heart of that. That's up to 50% off during Lamps Plus holiday sale. November 25th through December 24th. Go to Lamps Plus, L-A-M-P-S-P-L-U-S dot com slash majority to start saving today. That's Lamps Plus dot com slash majority. Quick break. Be back with Digby. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is always a pleasure to welcome to the program the person that inspired this, I would call it jingle, maybe. <laughs> are you ready for some pee-pee? Second, I don't remember that part of it. I don't either. <laughs> I didn't. Wait, I didn't. I did not register that. I had been playing a shorter one, but uh, I found a longer one. Oh my gosh! There you go. Wow, that's great. It's about wow. time, ladies I think and gentlemen. Song invented Chill Wave. Well, I was going to say Heather Parton Digby. Welcome to the program. That that thank song you. is so chill that it yeah. almost feels. Not of this era or even <laughs> remotely appropriate. Um, and well, maybe neither it's... am I, so that's, that's it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel like, I don't, I, I mean, I guess there could be some people who are uh, appropriate to this era, but it really just seems <laughs> like, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously getting a little bit uh, reflective because we're at the end of the year. Um, we're arguably at the end of the decade. Many people will mistakenly assume that we are. And so we have to play along, uh, really ends at the end of 2021, but, um, I mean, 2020, but, uh, nevertheless, um, let's just spend two minutes talking about the past 10 years. Nuts, right? Nuts. Crazy. Crazy. And, uh, you know, I've been through some crazy decades and this one really takes the cake. I, uh, I and it seems like it's both rushed by, you know, just it seems like it was yesterday that it was, you know, 2009, 
But at the same time, there has been so much that has happened that it, it also feels like, you know, it's been it's been 50 years instead of 10. It's been amazing. And I was thinking about this last night. Um, and, you know, I mean, the beginning of this decade was Occupy Wall Street. Yeah. Can you believe that? Yeah. And I think I think that, you know, and reflecting on that, I think that really this decade – Trying to see, you know, think about what really happened. And it's tempting to talk about Trump and, you know, all that. And, of course, that was, you know, to me, that was just the natural evolution of where the Republican Party had been going for a long time. But the rise of the left, I think, has been uh, unremarked upon as this decade, as, you know, maybe the most important part of this decade. I mean, we know the rise of the right. We've, you know, talked about it ad nauseum. But, when Occupy Wall Street started, it started in 2010 in September, um, and I think it kind of, you know, I think it was it will look, be looked back upon as a watershed moment. Um, and at, you know, we, I mean, obviously, we'd all been talking about that stuff for years, and you know, the left had been building itself in small increments, but that really, really bursted into a new level, I think, of awareness. And it's why we, you know, now see, like on the presidential debate stage, two, you know, left-wing candidates who are doing very well. Um, One of them may end up being president. And you see a left that is far more influential, and you see the ideas that undergirded all that becoming much, much more mainstream. And, you know, this stuff does take time. So 10 years, that seems – I mean, I'm sorry to, you know – tell all you young folks that it takes that kind of time but sadly it does but um that's why you know you keep you keep at it and uh you know here we are 10 years later and a lot of what they were talking about in the street in Zuccotti Park uh are on the mainstream stage with democratic candidates debating about it so you there, know, this is this I is I, I think that is um I I I think that's such a um I, 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 I think that's so spot on. And and I do think that it's we're, we're going to hear we're not going to hear much about that. But that is really the story of this decade. Um, Donald Trump is a culmination of stuff that existed back in 2008, without a doubt. You know, and I mean, it, it, it was the culmination of the conservative movement. You and I have been talking about that in the aughts quite a bit. And um, I mean, I distinctly remember um, there are two two moments where I distinctly remember that give me a sense of like where of what my sense was as to where things were around that time when current the um the the Al Gore network launched okay. as a as a left network when when Oberman left MSNBC and went over to current um and I don't think it had quite launched yet they were meeting and I remember meeting with the dude who was running it some idiot from CNN. I mean, just like sort of like, I think it was the one who like developed the hologram or something like that. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, when oh they, But I remember sitting in his office, and this must have been about 2009, 2008. And I said, you know, I think the big argument that's going to happen now is, is outside versus the inside. The, the the people who are agitating on the outside versus the inside, because it was clear that Obama by the by the summer of Obama of, of 2009, that Obama was already backtracking on a lot of stuff that he said was really important to him, particularly the bankruptcy bill was the first thing. You bet. And um, and then I remember when we launched this show, one of the first guests we had, maybe the first one was Winner Takes All Economy. I think it was like Jacob Hacker's book. I think so. Uh huh. But I remember the idea being like, nobody's talking about <clears throat> this, you know, the concentration of wealth. I mean, you know, Bernie had been talking about it, but Bernie Sanders was way off the national radar. I don't think he had ever been yeah. on a national program except for like maybe a Donahue, intro, you know, um, the, you know, sort of like documentary piece. Like, look at this guy. This is crazy. Um, uh, you know, he's a socialist who's running, you know, is the mayor of, uh, of Burlington or something. I mean, we had him on the old majority report, but that was no, there was no one else talking about that. There right. was no, the, the words wealth inequality, the concept of the 99%, it did not exist, um, at that time in, you know, in, in, 
in terms of like mass media and and broad conversation, obviously there's been people who've been talking about it for forever, including Bernie. But the, in terms of like the way that you would hear it in the in the the news or the national psyche, it just was not there. And um, in some respects, that's what I think. What took people for you know such a surprise with uh, Occupy, at least the sort of the broader society. And I remember it was another guy. I think his name is DeGraw. David DeGraw, I think his name was, who had this concept of, you know, there was a bunch of different people who were responsible, I think, for uh, for Occupy. You know, some of it came out of Adbusters, some of it was David Graeber. Uh, there were others. But this guy, David DeGraw, earlier that year had been trying to, 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 um, had been, I know had been writing or, 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 or talking about stuff that, uh, within X amount of miles of wall street, uh, there was a huge number of people who had been devastated by, you know, the, the 2008 crisis. And I think people right. were still, you know, people remember when we're talking about 2010, we're really only like, 12 months out from when it really the, the the crap hit the fan right i mean it was it was in the fall of 2008 right before the election that um we hadn't even quite bottomed out i don't think the bottom was no, hit until have. like uh, early 2009 or so maybe even uh, mid 2009 in terms of job losses and whatnot so this is very fresh in the mind i think it, you know we were we were the financial crisis had hit, but the sort of reverberations were were still were still happening, and people I think were just not conscious of what was going on. And since Occupy, the um, the 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 idea of wealth inequality as the primary problem in this country just got um, uh, just exploded, and um, it impacted everything. I, I I agree with you. I don't I don't think. There is a, like a like ten percent as much a recognition of how quickly this country has moved to the left, uh, or how strong the left has become in these ten years as as there should be, because that is really the the primary story. Well, that's that's what I think, and I and I have been, you know, I I mostly cover what's happening with the right wing. It's always been sort of my, my beat. And so I'm, I'm very interested and, you know, frankly, frightened to death of what they have become. So, you know, I tend to keep my eyes on that. But it seems obvious to me and those of us who've been, you know, watching politics closely on the Internet for the last couple of decades, um, people like you and me have been doing this sort of thing. Um, you can really see the change. I mean, if I go back and look at the stuff I was writing back in the early 2000s uh, on my blog and, you know, the forums and various places where we were all discussing this stuff, we were way, way out of the mainstream. I mean, yep. there just was nothing, as you point out. And, and it, you know, the, of course, the financial crisis was the catalyst. Um, but, you know, and, and there, of course, you know, you have to give credit to not just politicians like Bernie, but there were economists and others who were going, you know, whoa, something's really going to happen here. And they've been talking about it for a while. But the reaction that happened to it, it with Occupy Wall Street, which was, I mean, it really shocked people. I don't know if people remember, you know, I mean, the press was walking around like they were, you know, doing anthropological, yep. um, you know, sort of missions in, deep into the Amazon. I mean, the way they were looking at, at the people who were doing this and, you know, that Occupy had tried to do a a lot of things, you know, a lot of things that they were experimenting with and doing it, you know, in these various, um, uh, you know, occupied territories around the country, around the world. I mean, let's not forget this was yeah. a global thing. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't just happening here. And and it the, the fact that that reaction happened that way, that this was kind of, you know, I mean, this is a version of street protest that was kind of unique. I mean, you know, we hadn't seen anything quite like that. And I think it was very effective in implanting, particularly in the younger generation who, you know, I mean, this may have been for many people, you know, their first sort of um, contact with the left. It was for me. Saw. It was for Jamie. I, I, I mean, yeah. after, I mean, I protested the Iraq war in high school. We did not stop the Iraq war. I kind of gave up and did drugs for a few years. And then I got involved <laughs> again around the time of Occupy. And I haven't stopped being involved since then. Or taking drugs. 
<laughs> yes, well, I have not stopped us, taking so drugs. There you go. Um, but you know that that definitely you know I can see that because if you if you you know if, if that's a moment of kind of clarity uh, for and there are a lot of young people your age you know I mean this is a big big generation and um, the fact that that was sort of happening there I think that may have fueled what we're seeing and it goes in a number of different directions it's not just economics I mean this is about a certain form of activism and just general worldview, you know, I mean, when climate change and guns and, and uh, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter, I mean, there's all this stuff that sort of bubble has bubbled up in the last 10 years uh, as a, you know, and, and I would categorize all of that as being part of the left. Uh, I think that's, you know, that that, that moment uh, really did sort of, you know, it, it uh, changed a, it opened the eyes of a generation. And, um, and I think that it's going to look, you know, be be remembered as something very important in the development of Ameri- of world politics. Yeah, I, I I couldn't agree more. And a lot of people went on from that and and, and applied lessons to other places. And it's interesting too. In, in many respects, it um it, it 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 in some ways it launched both. Um, in terms of like national acclaim and their sort of their identities, it launched both Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. And um, uh, I think in terms of like it empowered uh, both of them in different ways at different at different points over the course of the decade. I, I also think that part of this is that and I, I don't want to r- r- reduce it too much, but I think coincidentally or maybe not coincidentally. I mean, maybe there's, you know, uh, somebody could draw a um, uh, uh, some type of correlation or some type of causation between the age in which boomers uh, uh, became in the aughts and their aggressiveness in terms of like seeking, um, you know, wealth and it being driven by uh, these innovations and, you know, it's it's hard to sort of dis- disentangle this stuff. But I, I th- there was a fire lit. There were embers. And I think and there was obviously this this sort of like inciting uh, moment in terms of the financial crisis. But I also think as someone who is, you know, a member of a generation that's sort of like n- will never, you know, Generation X is always going to be, you know, in the back seat. Right. It's just not it's not we weren't in the front seat for a long time because uh, the boomers were there. And then um, the millennials essentially just uh, the first time they got into the car, it feels like they were in the front seat. (laughs) And and the reason is I'm just I'm quite convinced it's just sheer numbers. I mean, we live in a consumer based society. And, um, you know, whether it's actually, you know, purchasing or just consuming media and 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 also generating media. And the fact is, is that the boomers, the the amount of boomers in our society was such that they dictated our culture um, and our politics and every aspect of our society. Um, And the Gen X just never had room and never had the purchasing power, you know, just to reduce it down to that. Um, I think it's an oversimplification, but it gets the point across. Never had the purchasing power to change society and the market, if you will. But uh, millennials come in and they, I mean, ironically, don't actually have the purchasing power. But they have the cult, the, the, um, the cultural consumption power, let's say. Yeah. Um, and a lot of these things don't cost anything except for your data. Right. Right. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just using that as a, as a, as a, as an analogy, because I think it's actually sort of like specifically untethered from that because, you know, cultural capital, I think is the word they use. Yes. Thank you. And, and it's the cultural capital. Um, and, but it's because of sheer numbers, I think, uh, really right. at the end That's of the day, right. I mean, I think that when you have the ability, when you get that sort of feedback of like, oh, there's a lot of people who are experiencing what I'm experiencing now, which is our aggregate wealth is, you know, a third of what it would have been if we had been born 30 years ago or 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And um, 
our uh, but our ability to sort of change culture is like, you know, the way it is with young people, except for we have the buying power, the consumption power. We can create our new, you know, and, and I think that crested during this decade as well. And I think we're, we're, we're seeing that now we're seeing it like, you know, with this new generation, I mean, there's a reason it seems to me that like we have the two, this is a little reductive too, but the, the most powerful segments of our Congress right now are people who are nearing 80 years old, right. In terms of Democrats and people who are just nearing 30 years old. I mean, that's pretty stunning. And I don't, you know, like th there's, uh, I, I mean, I, maybe that happens a lot in history, but when you look at the, like the two biggest fundraisers in the democratic party in the house, it's Nancy Pelosi and AOC. And, um, and, and I think that is, that is also the story of like what this, you know, in, in this next decade will be the, the AOC's the squads decade, however you want to say it will be their decade, but this is the oh, one that sort of gave rise to it. Absolutely. And, and that is looking at the future. I mean, that is where it is now. I will say this just to, you know, be, being a boomer, I have to point this out that Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, the rest, they're not actually boomers. They're silent. They're older than, than most boomers are. That means nothing other than just to say it. Um, but yes, the baby boom. And also just, you know, I, I you have to, you have to look at the fact that, uh, you know, the baby boom are, you know, they're getting old and they're going to die. I mean, they'll be around, though, for a while. They're, you know, I should say we because I'm one of them. They're going to, you know, we're going to be around for the next 20 years or so in a, in a large numbers and we'll have to be accommodated on some level. Um, but, yes, the next decade is the rise of the millennials uh, or the, the assumption of, of um, you know, cultural uh, you know, ascendancy of uh, of the millennials. And, uh, you know, uh, this is good news for, for those of us who care about all these issues, because the millennial generation is uh, very, I mean, not all, I mean, I, you know, we don't want to just, you don't want to paint with too broad a brush, because there is, you know, there is a an ascendant right as well. And there's plenty of young people that are involved in that. But the vast majority are, uh, you know, liberal, tolerant, um, you know, concerned people uh, about all the issues that those of us on the left, boomers and otherwise, have been caring about for decades and kind of flailing against um, a very, very organized right wing that has done everything in its power to stop us from from doing the things that, that we believed in. And they are also aging out, and they're also their or their movement, the conservative movement, which has been ascendant since I was a kid, you know, going all the way back to Goldwater. Um, it's dead now. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to replace it, but whatever they they called it, thought they were, and called themselves, is no longer operative. I mean, they, there is no ideology anymore. This is purely just a tribal kind of cult that. Um, is, you know, concerned with plutocracy and power, and, and there's nothing else to it. So, you know, we are entering a very, very um, untrod sort of yeah. time. Uh, you know, this we don't know where the ideology is going, but I do kind of, on the right, but I do see it on the left seems pretty coherent to me. And uh, that kind of gives me hope because that's that's the group I'm with, that I've always been with, and I'm glad to be with them as I get older and uh, they start to take power because I think we're, I feel actually optimistic about that. If we can get through these few years of transition, I think that the next, uh, you know, the next epoch in American history, in the world's history, you know, theoretically anyway, should be a lot better with this particular group. I, I, I think that's actually also another great point is, and, in, in, you know, I remember uh, in, in, you know, 04, 05, you know, reading um, uh, Sullivan, I can't even remember his first name now, and Andrew, uh, Andrew Sullivan, and, and him writing about how there are members of the, you know, of, of the conservative um uh, uh, universe, you know, we used to call them movement conservatives, but there are members of the conservative universe who are not preaching like, you know, uh, George Bush is not uh, a, a true conservative. And I remember at the time saying like, this dude doesn't quite get it. Like, this is like saying, 
you know, people are just not speaking Latin enough anymore. And, um, <laughs> and, and it's, you don't even hear people making that argument anymore. Like it's, no, it's so gone. far gone. The conservative ideology is so bereft um, that, and even, even almost like Republicanism has lost any, it has become untethered, right? Like the whole thing about the deficit scolds. Now I, I'm quite convinced that uh, Republicans are going to reconvene in in some fashion. Like, you know, I keep reading about, you know, these never Trumpers who are out there going like, the, 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 the Republican Party has finally <laughs> destroyed itself by supporting Donald Trump in this thing or that thing. And I feel like that article, I've been reading it the same thing for three years. Um, <laughs> and the fact of the matter is that they are, um, they need nothing to reconvene and reconstruct themselves. Uh, they will just come back as they were and pretend like none of this ever happened. But the problem is the ideology has been hollowed out. There is no ideology and it becomes almost right. at that point, it, it becomes untethered. Even if they never believed it, it, you lose the watershed in which you're yeah. telling your, your stories about it. And that is, that's when I think, you know, it's not hard for me to imagine we continue on with this intense polarization and it, and it is, um, you know, we watched you and I watch the right move further out on the uh, uh, on the the sort of the spectrum of the of the, uh, you know, to the right. And uh, we're now seeing the 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 left say, like, well, um, we have some ideas, too, and are actually headed out in that way, too, which is and getting stronger, frankly, which is increasing the polarization. And in my estimation, it's the only way to go. You know, there's no. There's no going around this. We need to go through it. And uh, but on the when we do get towards the other end of that side, you know, the idea of like uh, the conservative movement is, um, you know, 30 percent of the country and uh, they're uh, aiding and abetting, you know, sort of like um, right wing terrorists. You know, it's not hard to come up with that scenario. Let's put it that way. It really isn't. And I mean, I've been, you know, I've been watching this my whole life. And they, look, the, the conservative movement was the most powerful political movement in America through most of my lifetime. I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, starting with the 70s going forward up until really pretty recently. They pretty much owned our politics. Now, again, the cultural capital that the baby boomers had was much more liberal. I mean, we saw a lot of changes with, with, you know, gay rights and women's rights and civil rights and, you know, across the board. There was a lot of progress made during that period. But on a political level, the right owned it, really. The the left was has been flailing, you know, through that entire period. And I feel like we were this big, close to getting Reagan on a dime. Yeah. Oh, we were. I mean, this was they had that they had a thing called the Reagan Legacy Project where they were renaming all these airports. I mean, you see it all over the yeah. place, you know, in schools and roads. I mean, they were going to turn him. This was a kind of a Leninist approach uh, spearheaded by a guy named Grover Norquist. Yep. And, you know, you haven't heard much from him lately. No. Um, and, you know, of course, he got his big tax cut. So, you know, he's probably just counting his money somewhere. But, you know, this this there, this has been the political story of my lifetime up until now. And that's one reason why I sort of flagged the Occupy Wall Street as being, sort of the, you know, the big, you know, the, the financial crisis and Occupy Wall Street as a, as a huge catalyst for for change. And 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 what has happened in its wake is that we're seeing the the crumbling of what was called the conservative movement for 40 years. And and what is going to replace it? I don't know. I think you're right. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of terrified by it in a way, because there is a lot of tribal um, identification among those people and driven by all the things we talk about all the time, the, the racial animus and the sense of you know, having their their prerogatives and their privileges being challenged by women and people of color and foreigners and everything else. So, you know, they're not they're not going to go away. I mean, these people still exist and they have they may you know, it's a white uh, party, basically, uh, people with a lot of money uh, behind them. There's that whole, you know, kleptocracy, plutocracy that undergirds everything they've done for many, many years, and that's not going to go away. 
So I'm not saying that the fight is over. I think in some ways it's well, just beginning. But it's a different fight than the one we've been having. And I think that's where you get the young people coming in. They have a much greater sense of confidence about this, and rightly so. You know, for people like me who were, you know, I'm thinking back to the Reagan years, you know, where it's just like, oh, geez, you know, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, it was like we didn't even exist. We were like, you know, completely people, Democrats sounded like right wing Republicans. I mean, it was it was it was really, really kind. It was depressing for anybody who, who cared about any of these issues. And. That's just not true anymore. It's a different thing. The fight is now engaged. And I always used to say for years, you know, this isn't a pendulum that we're talking about. It's a seesaw. And unless the left gets some heft on its side, we're going to be hanging out up there while the right wing continues to, to you know, hold down, every, you know, all the power and all the, you know, the resources and everything else in politics. So, you know, this is this is what's changing. And the character of it, I can't really describe. I don't know. And I'm afraid there's, you know, there could be violence. It could be something, you know, pretty awful, because in the in the context that this is happening of climate change, for instance, um, we're going to see a lot of disruption, and it's not going to be pretty. But I don't think that we're going in unarmed this time. I don't think that the left is without, you know, is kind of, you know, in a in a vul- in as vulnerable position as it yeah. was for the last 40 years. I, I mean, I you know, the other one last thing, and then let's we'll we'll talk about uh, what happened last night. But um, okay. I just think what one of the like one of the markers for that is I just remember in 2004. Um, the, uh, the, the, you know, getting, uh, getting phone calls from right wingers on the radio going like, you're a liberal. And I'd say, well, actually, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm to the left of that, but, uh, you know, so, and he's like, well, you just admitted it. And I'm like, well, I'm on a liberal talk radio network. <laughs> like it was to call yourself a liberal in this country. In the late 90s, early aughts was yep. l- was particularly in the, in the early aughts after after 9-11 was in some areas dangerous. I mean, li- literally was. dangerous. And uh, because after of, 9-11, it right, sure was at, because of, uh, of, you know, the potential for right wing violence. I mean, this is yep. this is I'm, I'm not this is not theoretical and um, or hypothetical. And w- within 10, 12 years of that time, um, when you call yourself a liberal, it is, or when someone calls you a liberal, it is, to the extent that it's like supposed to be an insult, it is coming from the left. That is <laughs> and, true. And, and, and that to me is Guilty just... Guilty as charged. It, that is just, I mean, that is a, an amazing turnabout, you know? I mean, it's just, it is just an amazing turn a, a change in our society. I mean, I, and I think that's a sort of like now, like, I don't know that people who aren't involved in politics are not, you know, are, are quite as aware of that. I don't think that's, you know, if, if I was to say uh, to, you know, I don't know, uh, some c- civilians, you know, some normies that you're a liberal, they wouldn't go, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's for dinner? You know, I, 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 I but I think the idea within th- this type of, you know, within our type of profession and in our, you know, sort of, you know, our non-civilian world, as it were, uh, that's pretty stunning, I think. Uh, I it is. Something? And, you know, liberal and progressive, both of those words and the arguments that we have within our own coalition over that, notwithstanding, neither of those words are now used as, you know, just outright epithets. Um, by, you know, average society, I don't think. And that was not true 20 years ago. That's right. I mean, you were, you might, you were a communist or maybe even, you know, a a child molester or something. I mean, it was terrible. It was really fearful to, to uh, assume that word to describe yourself in some company. I mean, I have conservative relatives and I was kind of, you know, maybe, you know, okay, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I vote democratic some of the time, you know, but <laughs> and then walk away from the conversation because that was not something that you wanted to, to call yourself. And I think that anybody now, you say I'm a progressive or a liberal or whatever, um, and I don't think it gets that same response in, you know, polite society that it did, you know, uh, 20, 25 years ago. Right. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Michael Dukakis was afraid 
to be labeled a liberal and not because yeah. that would signify that he did not have a, you know, um, a, a Marxist critique of what's going on. It was, <laughs> right. it was, you know, because he did, if uh, he was called that. Um, but go ahead. Can I say something about Occupy? I feel like it's fairly on topic because we're talking about it. And I was a part of Occupy Wall Street and really forged a lot of the politics I have now at that point in time. Um, it also didn't hurt that I was dating sort of a libertarian communist. But um, the <clears throat> primary goal of Occupy Wall Street was not to realign the Democratic Party. And it wasn't no. to elect a social Democrat president. Um, it might be a good outcome of it. But I mean, the people that I knew, the people that I met around that time were very principled anarchists and libertarian communists, those types who really had a horizon level goal of overthrowing capitalism. Nobody thought that we were going to do it by occupying Wall Street, but it was it was the start of something. And we've seen, you know, uprisings around the world. Um, and I think perhaps the liberal left, the progressive left is stronger than it used to be. The anti-capitalist left is also stronger than it used to be, but it's still incredibly weak. Like DSA has 60,000 members, I think, or thereabouts. It's about as strong as it's been maybe since the 60s. Still not strong enough to accomplish our goals. But like, I, I still hope that we can have some sort of popular front of the left with leftists and liberals. And I appreciate the love that you guys are giving to Occupy right now because like it shows that you recognize, even if you don't agree with anarchists and communists, that you need us as part of some larger left movement and popular front. And like, I'm hoping, like I said the other day, I see a few different paths forward to like solve the problems, the crisis that capitalism is in right now and has been in arguably since the 70s. One of them goes through social democracy and a parliamentary road to socialism. The other one involves a lot more human misery to come first and you know given those choices i would of course prefer the one that involves less human misery and i think you guys are probably in agreement with me on that yeah of course and and i, I would say i mean my experience of 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 having been down at, at zuccotti park and gone to a couple of uh of the other uh encampments and, and talking to a lot of people at the time was that there was there was a there was a diversity i mean there's certainly i think you know um, the, 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 the group of folks, you know, associated with Graber that started, you know, uh, Zuccotti were definitely more sort of like a, the, um, uh, anarcho, uh, in, in various flavors, I think of that. Yeah, fresh off um, the new school occupation. Too. Yes. But there was also, like I say, this David DeGraw who had a sort of a contemporaneous idea, I think was probably more of like a almost, uh, you know, just a sort of a, an anti-finance um, uh, type of uh, of lefty. And I think there was a um, I mean, I th my sense was that there was a sort of a broad range of people who were literally at Zuccotti. And certainly coming out for the marches. That's where Tim Pool made his bones. It's where Tim Pool and the guy he was with actually going around was was quite good. And I can't remember his name, but he he I think he recognized that there was something up with Tim Pool quite early. Uh, but but there was a broad range of people um, if, from my experience at, at Zuccotti. And I was, you know, down there. Uh, I was was not obviously sleeping out there, but I was down there on a fairly regular basis. Yeah. Um, I mean, interviewing people. One of my critiques as well of anarchist horizontalism, which is that it is a little too open ended and a little too disorganized and can decay into all different sorts of liberalism and even conservatism if you're not careful. But even in the first like week, there was a mix of people there. I, I mean, that, you know, I think like it's certainly um, the um, the, uh, you know, sort of anti-hierarchy uh, folks drove the place uh, without a doubt. I mean, I think, and that's, you know, that cuts both ways uh, in some ways, but, um, but, but regardless uh, of, you know, uh, it, it's not, I don't think it's controversial to say that like, you know, when things move to the left, it's because, you know, people on the furthest most regions of the left are pulling it that way. Um, and different people end up, you know, in the sort of the, the, the co-incentral circ uh, co concentric circles. And in my experience, anyways, it usually lands not 
you know, close to the polls. It's just a question of like, you know, how far is the the poll on the left? But yeah, it was definitely instructive for me as well. Like I decided not to be a full on anarchist after that because I was like, well, I feel like we could be a little better organized in some <laughs> ways. And, you know, some of these folks need a more uh, Marxist material analysis, which is like I did not know what that meant at the time, but I just knew that it was something I wanted. You just knew you had to get away from the drum circles. And uh, <laughs> oh, that's, so, that's for sure. Um, all right. So, Heather, let's let's get let's 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 move back. Uh, let's let's become a little bit less reflective uh, and a little bit less uh, theoretical and uh, a little bit more substantive about the you know, we were talking about, like the, the sort of the folly of trying to um, uh, to re uh, recap the decade. But I think actually we did a pretty good job of that, to be honest with you. Um, I wouldn't want to reca- recap this year. Because that's um, like you'd actually have to go through like there's no way for me to get a sense of the, you know, sort of like the broad strokes of this year at this point. I feel like I'm about to pass out. Um, And even this week seems sort of more than I could digest. But there are two big stories this week, it seems to me, or really one big story. But in the debate, I think was also we've had a turning point in the race in the Democratic race, I think, is also the case. The big story this week is Nancy Pelosi holding back these articles of impeachment because as far as I can tell, it is the first sort of like proactive, aggressive move, power move by the Democrats in and that I can remember in a long time. And let me just sort of qualify this by saying, meanwhile, the legislation that was passed this week, I think is largely garbage and um, has not deserve gotten the scrutiny that it deserves. But I think there's a certain inevitability to this type of thing in this in this era. Uh, but I'm trying to stay positive and see that the exercise of power by the Democrats um, and I'm just convinced that this generation of Democrats that's in charge right now is never going to get us to where we need to get from a um, from a, from a sort of policy standpoint. But um, at least the idea of like, this is what it feels like when Democrats exercise some type of power, and it's not a huge power, but withholding those articles of impeachment is like a – it's a power play. Oh, there's no doubt about it. I wrote about this for Salon this morning, um, and it, of course it's a power play. And it was very surprising for the, for the reason that you just you know sort of indicated. I didn't expect it. Um, I, I honestly didn't. Everything I saw from uh, the, the leadership of the Democratic Party was that this is going to be an extremely buttoned up conservative approach to impeachment, which always struck me as bizarre since impeachment is anything but that. It's, a, it's the most, um, you know, political act, really, that, that the Congress can make. And I'm not talking about partisan political. I'm just saying it's, this is an exercise of power by the U.S. Congress against a sitting president. And that's one reason why it doesn't happen very often. They usually work out their differences before it gets to that point. And it's so unprecedented that there's no roadmaps for it. Like there's, you know, it's like people are saying like, you know, what Pelosi's doing, you know, Noah Feldman came out uh, the other day, uh, the guy who testified on behalf of the Democrats saying that this was impeachable. He wrote an op-ed saying, well, impeachment hasn't happened until they deliver these articles of impeachment to to the Senate, which is all right, fine. Uh, you know, yeah. to tell the New York Times to issue a correction on their on their headline exactly. the other day. You no, know, he hasn't been impeached. And and by the way, fine because I think they should continue with impeachment. Exactly. <laughs> they, you know, there's a lot more to go, to talk about it with that. So fine, we didn't really impeach him. We're just in the process, and that's fine with me. And I think that I think that Pelosi. You know, this this was a surprising move, but, uh, you know, it, it makes perfect sense to me. Yep. I mean, I don't you know, there's a, of course, you know, this is what Democrats and what what, you know, liberals, progressives, all of us on this side deal with, which is the hand wringing about absolutely everything. The, any kind of, of use of partisan power is that you always get the hand wringing from me. Oh, my goodness, it doesn't look good. And, you know, she shouldn't do this and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, whatever. And and I actually am impressed with the fact that Pelosi is saying, talk to the hand. I'm doing what I'm doing. I don't care what the Republicans say. You don't know what you're talking about. And she's just kind of dismissing all of this, this pearl clutching over what she did. 
of course it makes sense. They, they, what, what is happening here, and you and I have talked about this a lot, Sam, on the, on the other show, is that you know, they're looking at a Senate here that they've got about six seats that are potentially flippable to the Democrats in 2020. And what that McConnell is desperate to do is to hold a perfunctory, you know, quick and dirty process that just blah, 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 you know, have a couple of days where some people say some stuff and then they vote. And that's that. And Trump walks, you know, struts around saying he's been totally exonerated, which really isn't the point. What he's trying to do is protect those people from having to take a, a public vote on something that really looks controversial. Right. Nancy Pelosi got some polling this week that shows that the vast majority of everyone in the country thinks that witnesses should be called for this Senate trial. And logic says, what's he so afraid of? You know, if he had a perfect call, if all this has been fine, then there's no problem. Why don't they have the witnesses? And that included 64 percent of Republicans. That was not something that Mitch McConnell wanted to deal with. And she saw that, and she and her leadership decided, okay, let's push this. Let's see how far we can get with this. Because McConnell, you know, I mean, up until the moment when the trial starts, he has, you know, a tremendous power over the Senate and the process and how that whole thing is going to unfold. Once it starts, he's just another member of the of the Senate, and everything goes according to a different set of rules than usual. Uh, but right now, the power is in Nancy Pelosi's hand, and she's decided to use it to try and force them, knowing that you know Donald Trump is going to go crazy because he wants his exoneration. Right? I mean, this is he's been impeached, but he hasn't been exonerated, and he is losing it. And you can tell that he is. I mean, he's obviously you know on a race edge. So she's playing this. Now, I don't know how long she's going to carry it out. I don't know what the result will be. Maybe they won't get their witnesses, or maybe it'll be some kind of tepid compromise that doesn't really get them everywhere, everywhere where they want to be. But showing this power, and I'm telling you, you know, it's long past time for the yeah. Democratic Party to recognize that their people need some red meat fed to them every once in a while, too. You know, we're not sitting out here, you know, maybe they everybody thinks we eat arugula, but we need our protein. And, you know, every <laughs> once in a while... They need to they need to give us a little something too. show that we've got some backbone and that we've got, you know, the, the a little bit of power on our side. So I'm all for it. And, you know, she can hold it out as long as she wants. As far as I'm concerned, I recognize that political, you know, that the, that the political, you know, Pressure is gonna build, right. yeah, require, you know, may require her to give in before I might want. But I am I'm very happy with what she did. And by the way, another point that I just want to make quick, quickly there's a lot of stuff happening right now with this Ukraine stuff, with Rudy Giuliani's out there shooting off his mouth. You know, Lindsey Graham went on TV yesterday and said, you know, basically told him to shut up, saying, you know, if you're going on TV and you're saying this stuff, you better know what you're talking about, right? Um, because they are very concerned about what Rudy is doing and with the fact that there is money flowing in from Russia to Lev Parnas, Rudy's yep. accomplice in this whole thing. And Trump is not being, is not paying for any of his defense. So, you know, you could make the case that maybe, you know, the Russians are paying for his defense. Along with that, there's this big scoop in the Washington Post this week about how all these senior officials, by the way, who are too still too chicken shit to, you know, put their names out there, who say that Trump's been saying from the beginning that Putin's the one who's been telling him in their secret meetings that Ukraine is <laughs> the ones who who uh, who interfered in the election in 2016. So, you know, these Republicans don't know what shoe is going to drop. This story is still alive. Whether or not the you know they want to get the impeachment over with, assured in their minds that that Pelosi won't do it again. Right. But this or as long as it's sitting out there, there's stuff there are Ukrainian and Russian shoes dropping all over the place and anything could happen. They know that. I mean, it probably won't. But you just don't know. It's right. making them very, very nervous. So that alone is worth it to me. Let them have a little nervous Christmas. I think that's fine. Well, you know, and enjoy. And I would say a couple of things. One is that um, the longer Pelosi does this the more damage it does to these Republicans who don't want to take that vote. Because every exactly. day it's exactly. a news story. It builds this notion of of that vote that Susan Collins or that, um, you know, that uh, Tom Tillis or that Cory Gardner, the vote they're taking is a controversial one. And, you know, I don't know that people look at the specifics, but, you know, that's the way it sticks in their heads. The other thing I would say, um, uh, based upon what you've said, is that there's two other points, too. Devin Nunes was on TV the other day trying to explain how 
Lev Parnas called his office and spoke to people at his office. And now he's suggesting that maybe he was talking to Lev Parnas's wife. Now, <laughs> oh, that's not good. <laughs> well, when, when you feel like you need to imply that you're having an affair with uh, this guy's wife as a way of saying that I was not in contact with him. That to me suggests that a mild state of panic has set in. Exactly. Um, and uh, talk about having a cow. Had to say it. And um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and and I think I think you're right about this. I think like they are worried about this being a live wire, and uh, that's unhealthy to them. All right, let's just say a quick five minutes about the debate last night. Um, I'm going to talk about it more later in the program. We did a wrap up, uh, you know, immediately following last night. Um, if you had to say, if you, if you, if I, if I appointed you Chris Saliza for the day, uh, and, uh, but, no. but only in format, not so much in the way, in, 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 just in, not so much in the content. Uh, uh, <laughs> all right. Let, all right let, let, let me rephrase that. I'm Chris Saliza's editor. You're not Chris Saliza. <laughs> and I say to you, uh, who are the three winners and the three losers uh. last night? Well, if I were Chris Saliza, I'd say it's so boring. I don't know why anyone would ever listen to it, uh, because that's how he looks at anything uh, that uh, you know reeks of real politics. Exactly. Um, the three winners. Well, that's really interesting because you know, to me, of course, being you know a, a, a member of the left, if not the anarcho um, libertarian <laughs> communist left, um, you, anyway. I uh, you know I have to look at. Um, at you know Warren and, and Sanders, who I think continue to just you know they're as they're as steady as she goes, and you know between the two of them, their polling looks really good for um, you know left leaning politics in the Democratic Party. So um, I I like to, I think that Pete Buttigieg did very badly. Um, yeah. I think that he has you know I mean I, I'm personally don't enjoy watching TED Talks. I certainly don't want to see one at a, <laughs> at a Democratic debate, and that's what it always looks like to me when he starts talking. Um, you know, he needs to have one of those microphones, you know, with the... Right, you know, that come the, across the face. Sort of and like, yeah. Speak, you know, one of those, and we're just walking around the stage. I mean, it's just, you know, come on, dude. And anyway, you know, I'm sorry. You know, this is just not where the party is. Uh, and I, I am, you know, I'm very hopeful that uh, he, he fades away uh, shortly, um, you know, and, uh, and, you know, I hate to say it, but I think just on a performance level and the way that the, um, the party, the, the, the media sort of reviewed it. I think Amy Klobuchar, um, did well, uh, she sort of stood out and maybe she's going to step into the Buttigieg slot, which is the centrist, um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, lane as they put it, you know, competing with Joe Biden. And, you know, Biden was Biden. I mean, I, you know, he is who he is. I don't know. I, his, the, the affection for him kind of escapes me. I, I don't, I don't have a feeling for that. Not that I have much of a feeling for politicians generally. It's not really how I make my, make my um, assessments of them. But, you know, I think he, he, you know, seemed to be, uh, you know, aware of where he was. I mean, I guess that's a good, <laughs> that's a good thing. Um, so, you know, I don't know what to say other than I think that, you know, we're seeing I, I did miss seeing people like Cory Booker and and uh, and Castro. I know that's a cliche at this point, but I do think that it would be helpful for uh, the Democratic Party to have a fully diverse um, slate going into the primaries rather than sort of having it be whittled down to uh, mostly white people and, uh, you know, mostly, you know, septuagenarians <laughs> so uh, and, and and pete Buttigieg. um so it, you know I, I don't know what to say other than when i, I wrote about it this morning you know, or right after the debate saying that i felt like sometimes when i go and watch these debates i feel like uh, it seems surreal to me because it feels like it's some other world that that politics is, exists in than the one that i am immersed in day after day which is this freak show yeah um but I think and that's good. That, I think that's good. I, I think that we're the, well, that's the idea I said, that after they, I, after, yeah. yeah, after 
I started after I started listening, I said, you know, it kind of felt like, you know, a comfortable pair of shoes and I was able to sort of relax and kind of go, "Oh, okay. You know, this is this is this is actual political discussion." So, you know, in that sense, I don't know if other people feel that, but but I do. I uh, and the thing I still, you know, and and we've already said this and 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 this maybe brings it full circle. The thing that I just, you know, uh, and, and maybe I'm used to it now. And, you know, we saw some of this in 2016 in the race between Sanders and, and, and Clinton. But just the idea that we're hearing about these proposals and and ideas and talking about things like, you know, you know, free uh, college or, or free health care at the point of service, wealth tax and this and that. And the people who are presenting these ideas are sitting, sitting in the middle of the, yeah. the room and it's December as opposed to you would hear one or two people say this in the first debate that would take place in the summer of before the primary and they would be on the wings essentially and it would be their one or two sentences that they get to talk about and half the time they were also sort of like that's all we want to hear from them because they're a little bit unsound on just about everything else like the idea that it, you know, you can actually see the physical representation of of the the centering of of politics that were sort of like just completely out of the, the, the you know, out of out of the realm, you know, 10, 15 years ago uh, is horribly encouraging. And I just hope it uh, I hope we get more of it. But Heather, absolutely. Thank you so much, folks. Digby is doing her annual fundraiser. There is no job that is uh, less thankful than a uh, than a blogger. Um, and um, we are, I feel so uh, blessed to have had your work, uh, Heather. And I, this is not a retrospect. I'm hoping it goes forward as well, of course. But I'm saying <laughs> uh, over the, uh, you know, I don't know almost 15 years uh that i've been reading you maybe it's 13 i can't quite remember uh it's from... 18 i hate to tell you oh boy <laughs> all right well so um you know folks head over to, to digby site and uh hit the donate or subscribe button on the uh, left um old school style non-patreon although we should if you if you want to talk about that i think uh, you should start a patreon but um yeah, maybe i should no, I think you should. We'll talk about that. But in the meantime, folks, head over there um, and uh, show some love to Digby. Uh, Heather, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, your time today. Oh, thanks for having me, Sam. I, I really appreciate that. Thanks so much. And uh, hey, happy you know, happy holidays to everybody. Right, exactly. Have a great New Year, uh, great Christmas, uh, if that's what you do. And thank you so much for everything you've done this year. And uh, I want to apologize in advance for next year. Man, you said the C word again. I know. I know. I've lost the war on Christmas. Bye, Digby. <laughs> Bye-bye. All right, folks. We're going to take a uh, quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Matthew Film Guy, who has been incredibly patient because we're running late. We're going to run late today. Last show of the year. All right. Be right back. Bad movie where there's no crying And in the keys to me in this red lion Where the love that you loved in the sweet says is no crying When the breath that you breathe in the street screams there's no science When you look how you look then to me that I see This is a life story, so there's no climate. We are back, ladies and gentlemen, in our never ceasing attempt to bring you news from every corner of the world. We have finally. After years and years of of talking about it and planning about it, we have finally, finally figured out how to um, commission 
a Sundance Film Festival reporter, and this is his theme song. Matthew, film guy, welcome to the program. Um, you are, I know that you are just um, walking on cloud nine, having won the Majority Report Sundance Stringer Sweepstakes. Um, Absolutely. That this has been a huge, huge uh, boon for you. Um, and how much are you looking forward to being our stringer at Sundance? I mean, it's the entire reason I edited this film, is just to be able to do this for the Majority Report and you, Sam. Which film uh, is yeah. that? Huh? Which film is that? So the film that I have mentioned on the show in the past, uh, Black Bear, uh, starring Aubrey Plaza. And this is your cue to talk about Parks and Rec for like a third time. But um, I've never that seen that movie. I've never seen Parks and Rec. I don't, Rec. I don't like uh, sitcoms. <laughs> I don't think comedy. Yeah, Aubrey Plaza, comedy star isn't of Parks designed and Rec, to and many other fine entertainment. Now including Black Bear. Um, that film that I edited this summer and we just are wrapping up now has gotten into the Sundance Film Festival and will be premiering there in January. And I will be going out there. Wait, wait, wait. Let the, let the fanfare, you, you just to fill in those blanks. So say it again, Michael. I mean, sorry, Michael. sorry. Matthew. A little bit of a, a delay here. I'm almost be on the you. libertarian line. All right. So um, Matthew, say just the part about what happened with Black Bear. Black Bear got into Sundance. And it's funny you say my name because I am going to go to Sundance to party with Matthew. In is that right? And I won't be here. Oh, that's, is that's that right? Potential. I wouldn't mind doing that. Maybe. Hey, do you need uh, help? Yeah. No. <laughs> hey, come on out. We, we got a, rented a big condo. Uh, Mary and I did for the cast and the crew to stay in. It's pretty full, but we can always uh, grab some kitchen floor for you, Michael, whatever needs to happen. Uh, <laughs> we're we're going to be going out there and uh, enjoying ourselves for like uh, five or six days. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of movies and uh, attending some uh, swanky events. Well, that's really exciting. I mean, to edit a film that gets into Sundance Film Festival is basically the, I mean, this is this is the, the peak, right? I mean, I guess theoretically you could get a you know, Palme d'Or or something at Cannes. But, uh, this yeah, is... you, you thought of something better there. Yeah, you did. Good okay. job. Okay, well, um, and, and but... you know, it would be nice... I mean, Toronto is also a very, very prestigious Toronto film festival. Yeah, that one's I mean, also good. They're really like, there's good like together. five sort of like inner circle festivals. Okay. But the right. premiere I mean, at Sundance is amazing, uh, especially for a lower budget indie film like this, which raises its profile, gets the chances of it being um, distributed way up there. So, uh, you know, that's sort of the next uh, plateau for it to hit. But that's I'm huge. very proud of the way the movie came out. So uh, I have every confidence that's going to happen. Well, congratulations. That's a huge deal. Uh, I, I had a, a couple of years in the independent film world, and so I know how big of a deal this is uh, and yep. what it could mean for you. Although, did you get into the Bermuda Film Festival? Oh, wow. No, I, mm, I'm not even right. sure. When's that deadline? We got to scramble. I don't know. I'm not know. sure. No, I'm we... not sure. Uh, what about the Brooklyn Jewish Film Festival? Did you get into that one? He teaches Brookline? it. Brookline. Oh, my Jewish God. Film this is... This is getting embarrassing i'm just I going mean, I, over I, the I, ones that i know were the most prestigious back in the day when uh my film was uh matthew i mean i Ma could, I, did matthew what about the that? seattle jewish when film when festival? matthew was 13 he submitted a film to the brookline jewish festival and it was about uh an evil <laughs> rabbi who over circumcises babies it was a horror film is that true is that true matthew <laughs> 
I really wish it was true. I was going to say. Sounds it, like a great movie. I don't know if you saw any of his early work, but that I, would not I, have surprised uh, me yeah, whatsoever. No, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing this uh, joke out of some experience with Matthew's uh, the, o- the over-circumciser. That's the, really a good the idea. over-circumciser. It doesn't sound that much more offensive than what Sam's film was about. So Wait, what? Oh, no, no, that's a different film. Uh, uh, that, that, the that, rabbis that. here. Oh. <laughs> The Orthodox Jewish postal workers? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I think that's what she was talking I'm talking that, about the Jewish terrorists. Yeah, that didn't... Right, that, yeah. that film Sure, no, that was, was my not, favorite. That's what drew me to that project. That, that film but, was uh, not... Sam, I, Sam, I actually can only hope that once we're at Sundance that, Sundance that we win the prestigious Black Diamond Award. That's really, to me, would be the grabbing well, the... I can arrange that to happen. Uh, I am on the selection committee. In fact, I am the selection committee. And, That's uh, what I thought. Well, I just thought I'd drop that, see if you can hook us up. Tell me what You've the rates are for a three-quarter page in Variety these days, and I can make that happen, my man. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll talk off air. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, there's, uh, you, you, frankly, so far, you're the only film that has submitted, and I don't really need to view them to make my decision. So. That's um, excellent. Well, all right, that's exciting, and um, you know, uh, of course, uh, you will be calling into the show uh, from Sundance, uh, yes. as, as you are you are uh, credentialed uh, from yep. the show, yep. and that is uh, yep. I'm going to be the official majority report correspondent at Sundance for the time that I'm there. I hope to be able to see plenty of movies, report back to you on all the goings on, and I hope to take hundreds of selfies. For free. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. Please do. Uh, That's good. That is bingo. Um, And this is in Park City, is that right? Yep. Park City, Biatch. Right. Of course. Is it necessary that you add that at the end of it? I thought it was in Uh, Utah. It's a a song. Michael got it. Okay. But anyway. uh, that, yes, it's in Park City. It's like a you know, it's like a swanky ski town that just like gets descended upon by the sort of Hollywood liberal elite scum. You're gonna hit um, the slopes. Be one of them. You're yeah. gonna hit the slopes. You're gonna ski or snowboard at all? No, I avoid anything having to do with skiing or going downhill or really anything physically active. But uh, I'll be watching a lot of movies inside in the dark as much as possible. <laughs> I, and there's uh, a lot of great movies coming out there that I'm really looking forward to. A lot of new work from directors I like, so uh, it's going to be very exciting. I've already been to one kind of uh, meet and greet here in New York where ooh. I saw a couple people whose films are definitely on my short list. I, I, I had a couple years out there. I saw Pi when it was first released, when Darren uh, Aronofsky and I were, were friends at I the love time. I movie. And uh, Louis yeah. C.K. had a 98, 98, 99, It must maybe. have been. I think I was there... Two years in a row. One was for uh, Next Stop Wonderland, I think, was there. And, okay, yeah, Brad Anderson, sure. And I spent the night, uh, one of the nights there, getting drunk, driving around town or going around town in, like, the shuttle buses with Michael Chiklis of oh, The Commish. Oh, wow. The, uh, the Commish. Yeah, the dude was from Massachusetts, and we just sort of, like, uh, I don't know if he was on his, that show at that time. I just remember hanging out with Chickless and thinking, like, this is just like high school. I have no idea. Man, I would, I would watch that buddy cop movie. Yeah. yeah. We're in Utah. The Commish. Chickless, we're in Utah. We're here. And, and we, the, and the we Shield, met, like, I, I think, didn't... was his big Oh, the Shield. Right, right. The Shield. The Commission. Maybe was after a... that. Yes. Maybe yes. you gave him the idea for that. I don't know. That was the commish, I think, that. was probably like, I, to be honest with you, I didn't see either one of those shows. But I, my sense I was were, the commish was like the family Della version Ventura. and the shield got darker, sort of. But yeah. um, you, were too, you were too busy watching Della Ventura to catch up on the commish. You know, was, that was the heyday of Della Ventura, too. I mean, yeah. Um, uh, do you remember? Did, oh, we didn't know each other at that time. When I that, went was through just, my... that was just prior to our fateful meeting. Yeah. Was I still I talking it... about Della Vincera at that time? Probably. I, you know, I can't remember. I, I, it's definitely come up once or twice in the intervening years, I can tell you that. Oh, yeah, of course. Now, uh, so, Matthew, um, uh, 2009, yeah. uh, 2019, I mean, it, yeah. it seems to me like this has been one of the best years of your life. Wouldn't you say? I mean, yeah, hard to argue. I was uh, doing the work that I love to do. Uh, that includes teaching senior citizens about the dark side of humanity through independent and foreign films. Uh, you know, uh, having uh, a, a, a very uh, 
enriching and um, sort of uh, challenging in the best way possible uh, a personal life with uh, two dogs and uh, a partner whom I love very much. Uh, we also both got to work on this amazing film, uh, Mary and I, upstate uh, all summer long, and uh, the film got into Sundance. And now I'm talking to you, so, I mean, put all that together, and, I mean, <laughs> can't think of anything better than that, except well, maybe it, getting the Palme d'Or can, but, you know. Right, uh, Palme d'Or can, and it does feel like, to a certain extent, the the energy and the excitement around your eBay store has sort of <laughs> diminished a little bit, but that seems there like... May, there may be an inverse relationship between professional success and eBay sales, which I'll have to live with somehow, but, you know, I, I wouldn't say it went completely away. There's There's been some drips and drabs all through. I'm still maintaining my uh, high seller rating. Uh, I mean, to be honest, the, the worst part about having worked on this film for the past six months is that I only saw about 100 movies this year, and this was a great year for movies, and uh, so my movie-going time took a little bit of a hit. But you know, 100 listen, movies? Given- what, is your average, what is your average year in terms of, of, of movie consumption? Like, I don't know that I've ever actually asked you that or been aware of a specific number, but now that you mention it, like... It does. I, I. It seems something that it's just almost completely obvious that all you do is watch movies. No, I'm not saying all you do, but I mean, I'm like you. You. I mean, I a- wish that was all I could do. I, I have to pay the rent somehow. But um, the 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 great thing is that website that I know I've dropped a few times here, uh, Letterbox.com. If you want to go find me, I'm Langdon Boom there on Letterbox. You can post a link on the web page. But uh, that is since that's come out, it's allowed me to transcribe all the movies I've seen since uh, I think 1995 when I was making a, uh, just a diary of them. And so you can just go and look and just see kind of like by year. And, uh, you know. All right, well, do me a favor. Just what tell me what the number again? is. I mean, just tell me what the oh, number is. Oh, yeah, you could also just tell Sam the number, but I forgot what Letterbox is. Sounds interesting. Oh, well, I, this year, the only number I can tell you right now is this year I saw 100 films. Like, uh, as of right now, there's still like a week to go. So, but uh, I think I think the previous year uh, maybe was a little bit higher, maybe closer to 200. But, um, That's double. It, it, listen, it went down since my, my heyday years. Oh yeah. Okay. What do you buy the uh, the notion though that that movies are over and we're in the television era? That's like a cliche I mean, I've been hearing for like I mean, ten years. I mean, I, I will just say this: like I, I'm so I'm Matthew the film guy, not the Matthew the TV guy. So that <laughs> always will be where my heart is. But yeah, I watch a lot of TV, episodic TV, these long sort of bingeable shows, and there are some filmmakers who've gone into the the tv game that are making as good a work or better than they ever did as filmmakers so i actually i think even brad anderson i can't remember exactly what he's worked on but he's had that like a renaissance in his career from being able to work on these kind of hbo shows and whatnot so oh yeah uh, brad know, brad has done a bunch of uh tv directing some and i mean but also film he had a film that came out was it beirut uh was uh one that he did recently and he's always like often like I don't know. Yeah, he does Estonia his own thing. But the TV, like the, 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 the renaissance stuff. of this TV that Michael alluded to allows some of these uh, artists who otherwise maybe some of their commercial venues have dried up a little bit to, to keep working and to be able to make some of their own personal films. Did you like what Scorsese so, said about the Marvel movies? I well, did. yeah, I mean, it's hard to disagree with him about that. It's just, look, I love The Irishman. I got to go see it on Broadway, and it was like a, a, a wonderful like capstone to his entire filmmaking career. So it's like... Uh, for a filmmaker who like influenced me to really want to be a director, like it's very hard to argue with his wisdom and his insight into that. Having said that, I I enjoy the odd superhero smashing up a city movie as well, and I just hope that the commercial prospects of those movies don't crowd out his kind of movie. And that's his whole point. Not that you shouldn't enjoy a mindless superhero movie once in a while, but that it's going to. Uh, you know, there's we need to champion these smaller movies or else they just won't get made. Because when even Scorsese can't get his gangster movie made, uh, it, it's not a good thing for movie in, in general. Yeah, that's um, that's a little bit scary. But, you know, the, the, these things ebb and flow to a certain extent, right? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And look, I, not to say, like, you know, be self-aggrandizing, but when a movie like Black Bear gets made, you know, it, it's on the strength of a couple people, actors like Aubrey Plaza and uh, Chris Abbott, who, you know, have somewhat of a cachet, not enough to make a hundred million dollars. Aubrey, uh, Aubrey Plaza was in Parks and Rec, right? Oh, yes, she was in Parks and Rec. I don't know if you've ever seen that, Sam. But yeah, from that, she's able to parlay that cachet to making a less than 
a hundred percent blockbuster type movie. And uh, as long as that's still a viable option, uh, I think good movies will still be getting made. It just so happens that some of the best movies I saw this year were just not American movies, and that I think reflects the values that other cultures are putting on their arts compared to us. Okay, and um, uh, I was thinking okay. about Scorsese. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Um, was it Scorsese or Coppola that said that, that who predicted what was going to happen with Coppola. the video cam? Okay, with the video camera. Coppola. Okay, and that totally came true in, in, totally. A, in a weird way. Well, Coppola, I, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, said you know we're going to have like teenagers making the next great American movie because of the video technology. And on some level, yeah. I think what the the part that he missed was like YouTube on some level, but um yeah the that that concept of i mean it, it's it, it would be interesting to go back to like the aughts and just think about you know as as digital was uh changing and and as like you know we were moving from film to video and and all those technologies were unrolling out there was there was a lot of predicting as to what would happen and weirdly a lot of it came true cuz usually that stuff never comes true but it did come true yeah, he kind of nailed that one. But you're right that the YouTube thing and the kind of uh, uh, coincidental like narrowing of the of the length of these things. Like, yeah, I think part of what Scorsese is also lamenting is that like our attention span has just gotten shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Uh, which is, I guess, why he made a three and a half hour movie or whatever it is, a three hour movie to punish um, everybody. And and it's got a it's got a a kind of you know it's it's good news bad news like everyone can can make a YouTube video but it's actually really hard the medium is the message in a lot of ways to to sustain the tension so that kind of colors what kind of content actually comes out of that so I'm sorry I did you say everybody can do a YouTube video is that what you said Yeah just yeah. like you're doing Right Okay <laughs> just wanted to make sure you said that yeah, everyone, you know, it, and and you can a lot you know, of your, movies your, get into Sundance. As as anybody. Anybody, I, What's that? You, I said a lot of movies get into Sundance. So, yeah, yeah, at least like a hundred out of I think I don't know several thousand that get submitted. So yeah, you know, so, it's not none. I mean, How many YouTube shows get views? Yeah, well, that's the other thing. It's also signal to noise ratio, and it's just like a fire hose of stuff coming at you, and everyone has to scrap for attention, and that also changes what you do. Okay, you that's very play. nice, young man. Can we watch when Harry met Sally now, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, actually, what I've been doing in my class lately is trying to catch up on some of the directors who have been some of the more well-known uh, Sundance kind of uh, celebrities or sort of made their names that way. And uh, uh, to get ready to see some of their newest films. And, you know, it's been hit or miss. Sometimes those movies try even the patience of the most sort of adventurous senior citizens. But um, uh, there is still an audience for this kind of movie. If you, I don't know, if you have, if you're, if it's in a class setting, you have a friend or a trusted celebrity or semi intelligent person on a podcast kind of point you in a certain direction. So, uh, you know, I'm not completely uh, despondent about the, the current state of film. All right. Good to hear it. Now, let's get to uh, let's get to the uh, let's cut to the quick. I am going to be um, uh, on vacation for, uh, you know, uh, eight days, eight working days, uh, eight well, glorious oh, that's working so good. days. Um, and um I got, you know, like I'm I got The Watchmen on my list. People say they good things about that show and uh other shows, Succession. I feel like I got to catch up on oh, that. You got to watch Succession. Succession is actually I I thought the first season was very uneven and the second season to me it shot off. It's okay, no spoiler okay. alerts around here. So what happened but, in the last I can, episode? I can tell you that Mary is like a huge fan of Succession and has said it's like as about as good as anything that television has Whoa! made. Whoa! She's like calling it like Shakespearean. So uh, I have that on my list when I eventually have time oh, to. Yeah. So Major probably... shot in Freud for the ruling class watching Succession. So, okay, <laughs> this is good. So, uh, but, but Matthew, what should I watch? What should I watch? What, what should everyone watch during this time when they're sitting around with their family? Uh, what, what do you recommend we watch? Right, and you can got, even say two things if you want, or three. Yeah, I got, I got two movies, both of which I just showed to my senior citizens class that went over well. Um, the first is a 
film that's basically like a compendium film. It's like nine short films that sort of in some ways inter inter connect but not really not in sort of like that Matthew way. I'm sorry Matthew I'm, I apologize are they at a point no, yet where they call you on your BS where they're like well, I understand it's Norwegian and it's about incest but really it's about consumerism can we watch something pleasant please <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Afterwards, at the end, uh, I get a lot of them come up to me and go, you know, these discussions are always very interesting, but can we watch something nice? <laughs> no, but they also get the like, you know, like, yes, I understand. It's a time travel. Con-. Like, they're absorbing your lessons. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, they're I'm listen, totally my class, fed up. They're self-selected as very, very sophisticated uh, uh, film viewers. So sometimes they have. In fact, last week about this film, the one I'm about to recommend, so someone definitely challenged me on sort of my interpretation of something, and they said it is like, you know, you're young, so you maybe you took it this way. But I think in all experience, and I was like, hey, maybe so. You know, it's a give and a take when it's a real, uh, you know, class situation. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, that does happen. And, Michael, you should audit my class sometime. Come I would on love by, to. Sit in. I, yeah, I show to. great movies, and the, Honestly, and the conversation is just worth the admission alone. I would love to. Which is free. Where is this class so, again? Uh, What's that? Where is this class again? Because I will totally it's go. A, it's at the Forest Hills Y W and Y H C. Sorry, uh, Y M and Y W H A. It used to be the J C C. They lost the franchise. Whatever. It's a Y. Central I'm Central Queens. It's in Forest Hills. I'm so there. So everybody within the sound of my voice. Wait a voice second. Is, it used to be welcome. a Jewish community center, and now it's a Christian community center. No, no. It's the it's the young men and young women's Hebrew. Academy or association, so there's no C in it. Off That's brand right. bullshit you need, is that? Wait a second. I was going to say, like, you need to get like accredited to be a JCC. Oh yeah, it's a national it's organization. Juice, and you got to pay fees or dues or whatever. You are going to pay yeah, fees or dues. I, J- I don't get it. Well, I'll put JCC right up on this door. What are they going to do? They're going to sue me? I, I mean, they might tell on you. Maybe they will, but I won't. Don't worry. You're safe with me. Yeah, I don't want to be associated with that. They do very hostile interviews, and I've heard them do. all criticize you. Know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, man. Well, anyway, last week I showed uh, a movie by a filmmaker named Rodrigo Garcia. I don't know if you guys know who he is. He's also done a lot of TV. He, he did a particular show that I actually didn't get to see, but was... Um, like his own creation called In Treatment. Um, but I know him from his independent films, and he's actually the, the, the son of the Colombian author, um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Oh, so wow. So he's kind of got like, huh? Oh, oh wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and his movies, like they don't quite have that sort of like magical realism that his uh, dad was known for, but occasionally there's a touch of it, and he's just... He's really like one of these really um, just mature, insightful, into human nature kind of directors that isn't making huge movies with uh, giant plot points, but, you know, very sort of quotidian small stories. And and this one is actually, it's called Nine, uh, nine Stories. I'm sorry, Nine Lives. And it is actually nine short films about nine different women, which is also interesting. He wrote and directed this movie where all the protagonists are women. And in various sort of, um, I don't know what you, what you call it, existential struggles. And it kind of takes you through uh, younger issues, through older issues, towards like end of life issues. And occasionally you'll see some repeatable characters come in and out of it. But it's just really great. It's It, it, it kind of forces you to kind of... Uh, switch perspectives like you're not necessarily on their side or not which is kind of my favorite kind of movie where it's not very black and white the sort of morality of things and it's just really um just like a a a challenging but touching movie and it went it went over huge with the senior citizens i can tell you that um but not because it was some sort of a pandering kind of a confection it was actually a very deep movie and uh, garcia's new movie is actually premiering at sundance next month so i hope to be able to catch that Great. Okay, um, Rodrigo Garcia. And then the, uh, can I just say, Rodrigo Garcia is adapting, it looks like, adapting his dad's uh, 100 Years of Solitude for Netflix. Ooh. Oh, no oh. shit. Yeah. Wow. That sounds great. Wow. Well, that it feels like his whole career. <laughs> this just did magical realism, now bankable. Um <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, they're good. I'm glad. Uh, but also, you know, all his other movies are great. Suddenly, too. the teacher becomes the student. Looking at her is great. Sorry. Go ahead. 
What's that? I said, suddenly the teacher becomes the student. Oh, yeah. Listen, Sam, I go into every educational uh, interaction uh, with a beginner's mind. You know, that's mm-hmm. the secret of my success. Okay. I don't know anything. There you go. Um, but um, the, the other movie I wanted to drop real quick is by another filmmaker, a female filmmaker, who's also a visual artist and a singer and a songwriter. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. Her name is Miranda July. She kind of has a bit of a sort of a indie celebrity around her, too. Queen of Twee. Okay, yes. Now, I normally am not uh, uh, sort of a, a fond of the twee, but her first film, which and I hadn't seen any of her films, which is why I showed this to my class uh, the other week, uh, her first film, Me and You and Everyone We Know, definitely the first third, you're just like, I am in twee hell. This is the tweeest twee that ever tweeted. Wait, what does that mean, but twee? It's just like like precious and sweet, but like kind of like... Where have I seen some, this before? Is she, is she a comedian? She's hipster BS. Is this a little less Anderson? She's out in LA. She's not a comedian. She in LA? I imagine no. so. She's well, actually, I, you know, no, yeah, maybe she is. I, I feel I'm not like clear she belongs in sorry. Portland. Is she, I, she seems like the most Portland person to have ever lived. Does she do like little, I, like short sketches? Uh, sketches? I'm not sure. She's done like museum installations, and like part of her movie oh, is like a critique of like uh, the curation kind of uh, ecosystem and the museums and the people who run them. So it's a more art world kind of stuff. I think that that's maybe where I've seen her work. She okay. probably has an MFA in something, you know, like that. But um, she's like if Yoko movie, Ono and you and... were like a hipster woman, child, kindergarten teacher, or something. Yeah, I guess so. And I, that's why I really did not want to watch this movie for like the first third of it. But guess what? It Brendan was doesn't so... like that description of her, I should just tell you. He thinks she's more talented than that. The first think, bad man I isn't think, a terrible novel. Either. I think Yoko Ono is super talented. I think Yoko Ono rules. Yoko Ono's? Yoko Ono's. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like all Yoko Ono's, one through five. But um, it, it, to me, Filipino the movie, the movie, movie wins you over. Because even though the sort of the, the conveyance is in this sort of indie super hipster kind of indie sort of twee mode, by the time you get to the moment where the five year old kid is on the internet in a sex chat room, like exchanging lines about poop with someone he doesn't know, uh, it's like it's it's investigating the sort of internet in a way. And this movie came out in 2005, so I think it was really prescient about the way that sort of the fire hose of information and availability is corrupting our innocence as a people. So it actually kind of takes that idea of being twee and being innocent and really, like, runs it through the mill. Like, it drags it through the mud in a way. And, but it and comes I think out. it's, like, a really important thing. Everyone We Know, is that the name of Me it? Me and you and everyone we know. Me it, and you and everyone we know. It, you come away thinking, like, maybe kids talking to adults about sex in chat rooms is good, actually. Maybe it's well, precious it, and sweet and adorable. Yeah. It has a kind of really ambivalent kind of take on it. I mean, it definitely touches on some dark things like the pedophilia and the really like a uh, lack of a parental oversight and, you know, just like adults who do not know how to be adults and all that kind of stuff. But in a way that I think, uh, you know, it's just like this movie has a lot of ideas that are thrown at you about a lot of different things. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's reductive. You know what Brendan just said? That I really no, I missed it. Sounds like boring Todd Solange. <laughs> I mean, it's way Boom. it's way deeper than Todd Salon. It's, oh, not, it's not boring. It's not boring. Oh, guns Dang. up. Whoa. And I, I actually I actually was a PA on Happiness, so I should have an emotional connection to that movie, but I don't. It's I mean it's it's shocking. He he's like you know, he's like Twee Howard Stern basically. <laughs> um, but. Uh, can I I will say the first one, possibility I'll see nine lives, the second one. I will probably no be re- I will be rewatching Coming to America. Wait, so what what movie are you recommending? <laughs> well, that's never a bad idea. Are What's you that? recommending Me and You and Everyone We Know or is there a new one? That's it. No, I'm definitely recommending Me and You and Everyone We Know. There is a new one. It's not out yet. It's going to premiere at Sundance, so I'm just kind of getting on the Miranda July train a little bit to just kind of uh, see what's what before I see her new one. I and I guess say, she has another one called The Future which I haven't seen, but I'm definitely interested in seeing it. I mean, again, I totally get the kind of uh prejudge kind of uh, harshness on a movie that I described, but that's why I think it's so worth uh, going to see because it definitely wins you over. I will say I went through a Miranda July phase in college when I was going through a very tough breakup 
So some of my dislike of Miranda July now is probably really directed at my former self. Interesting. All right. Well, you should forgive your former self. Maybe there's something there. For being so weak and having so many feelings. No, feelings are fine. Feelings are fine. Even the twee ones. In a certain sense. Matthew Film Guy. What about the Irishman? That was great, right? I love I love it. the Irishman. Yeah, it was amazing. That. If it's the last film that Scorsese makes, he went out on top. It's like the capstone to all the themes that he explored throughout his really yes. his other great films, uh, Mean Streets, Goodfellas, Raging Bull, Taxi Driver. It feels like the last 45 minutes of that movie make it a masterpiece. Uh, up until then, it was like a good exercise in what he does, but the way he kind of added that sort of coda about him being old, not to spoil anything, uh, really – Put it above and beyond for me. And the age aging stuff was intentional. I just wanted to say that. I don't know. I thought I thought it was pretty amazing. I, and in some ways, I, did, I wasn't bothered by any of that aging. I, stuff. I thought it, it was intentional. Out. And I just want to say too, without overstretching it, the politics are pretty good in that movie in a way that is not forced oh, yeah. or preachy. Oh yeah, no, I was super it's impressed. It's not it's not rose colored, but it's also really like yeah. You're like yeah, unions, mf'er. Speaking of politics, what about Parasite? I would assume that would be extremely your shit. Well, it is still on my short list, so uh, I have not yet gotten to that. But uh, I love the South Korean films. Uh, Hong sang Soo has become my new favorite filmmaker. And um, Bong Joon-ho's Okja, uh, as which I recommended before in this show, is one of my favorites. So I've definitely got Parasite on my short list. It could be one of the next movies I see, but unfortunately I haven't seen it yet. It's so good. And it has the best politics. And Bong Joon-ho is amazing. And you introduced me to him when you told me to watch Okja. So thank you. Nice. Thanks for that. I'm glad to do some good here. Sam? Uh, film guy Matthew. <laughs> I want You should see it too. What? I'm saying you should see some of the films I recommend too. Cause Someday see how I will. Works. Someday I will. But I will yeah. tell you that um, the... Uh, I, I, my appreciation for you extends beyond watching a film here or there or not watching a film ever uh, that you right. recommend, although I have watched multiple ones that you've recommend, which is a good nice. thing. Um, I'm going to eat apples and watch but, Dirty Harry, so sorry. That's actually... Doesn't sound bad, right? Doesn't sound bad. Uh, but Matthew Film Guy... Thank you, not just for coming on in 2019, but in coming on in 2018 and 17 and 16 and 15 and 14. And uh, I'm very grateful as we enter the second decade of my knowledge of you as a person. Uh, actually, wow. we have almost wow. we're almost coming close to our our 20th anniversary of knowing each other. Uh, Matthew wow. Wait, guy. What, is, is that like the paper anniversary? What is it? What do I get you? I don't know. Well, I mean, maybe uh, let's not go overboard. So that way we're, okay. I, neither one of us is too committed <laughs> to having to go out and shop. Uh, but uh, Matthew, film guy, a weighted blanket. Yeah. I'm so glad uh, that uh, your film got into uh, Sundance. I'm looking forward to it winning the Sundance d'Or or whatever the award is there. I can't remember I'm which sure one. Will. I did not win. And um, uh, I, I hope you win it. I know this is just the beginning for you. Um, at one point, you'll probably feel like I don't have the time to go on that show anymore. I'm no longer, you know, just uh, the majority reports Matthew Film Guy. I'm everyone's Matthew Film Guy. Like Matthew Film Guy's like, I'm sorry, Sam. I'm actually negotiating getting funding for a new <laughs> film about a criticizing capitalism through the medium of incest uh, and i'm negotiating with an armenian arms dealer right at the <laughs> it's on the french well, Riviera. Look, i'm not i'm not i'm not saying that's, that that definitely won't happen but uh let's just say i look forward to that being a problem i have to continue it's not going to be awesome well, when you and- get money from like emirati arms dealers to make your like feel uh, movies that like defend human emotion or whatever matthew i mean it that's what i'm what picturing for you in in, in mise-en-scene is Right there, boom. Well done. Touche. Um, and uh, uh, Matthew, I hope that uh, when you do go to Cannes uh, with your film, that um, you will uh, choose to bring me as part of your uh, your crew uh, there. And uh, we can hit the, the nightlife and the blackjack that, table. Whatever the. Definitely. Whatever the oh, yeah, rude, uh, whatever it is, uh, where everybody hangs out in Cannes, that would be great. But in the meantime, uh, Matthew Fumbay, have a um, happy holiday and happy new year. Same to Mary. Thank you so much, Sam. Same to you, all you guys there. Take it easy. Talk to you in 2020. See you in 2020. 
All right, Matthew Film Guy, ladies and gentlemen. There he oh, goes. Man, 2020 yep. is going to be a big year. 2020 is going to be nuts. Everyone go see Parasite. Don't read anything <laughs> about it. Just go see it. You'll thank me later. What, read the Wikipedia. See it? Is, in the, read. is it in the, the theaters? Or I think can I so. buy it? Can I, can I see it online? I don't know. I think it's still in the theaters, I thought. But I feel like everything is all mashed up now. I mean, you can definitely pirate it online if you want to. Well, I'm not. I would never. Uh, I feel like Parasite? the filmmaker wouldn't care. Parasite is Yeah, it? it's so good. Okay. Got that one down there. Um, all right. Let's, uh, let's do a couple of clips. I mean, well, Freebie Friday, right? I mean, what the hey? It's going to be a long show, folks. But um, you'll have a week and a half to... Uh, to enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, this one's got to last you a while. It sure does. Um, let's do this just to, uh, to. it's been a while since I've uh, had a debate with a, a libertarian. And um, um, I, I don't know well, where this cropped up in my thing. And I don't know why we haven't heard from this guy ever. Um, he seems to be um, uh, super confident about. So what his, happened? About his ideology, um, and he has uh, he has his own show, um, and apparently his guru is Walter Block, uh, and Walter Block, of course, has been a guest on this program at least two times, right? Maybe maybe three, but um, and he uh, seems to be he. It's a it's a fascinating rant because. Um, and and I must warn you, there are expletives, um, because we know that libertarians are rebels. I swear a lot. But what's fascinating about this rant is it is um, he is both sort of like completely sure of his position, um, denigrating of those who disagree with it, and offering absolutely no substance uh, whatsoever. And so... I am going to dispose with his argument rather quickly after he, to the extent that he makes it, makes it, and then say, uh, anytime you'd like to come on and have a, uh, a larger discussion about it, uh, welcome to do that in 2020. I want to point out that this is Eric, how Eric July clipped this himself. Eric July himself clipped this. Yes. Okay. And this is the name, and then he has a YouTube show. Uh, maybe Twitch. A Twitch show? Is it a Twitch show? Okay. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And he, he seems to be a huge fan of comics. Cool. I mean, I, I'm just I'm just watching from his thing. and uh, Surprising for a libertarian. Is that? No. Mm. Okay. Yeah, no, right. Okay. I get it. <laughs> a bunch of friggin' nerds. Maturity. Uh, um, and uh, here it is. Um, here he is uh, making the case that if you bring up the most obvious, obvious argument, um, then that is just, that is remedial in his mind. All right, man, this should go without saying it, it should, but unfortunately you fucking level one rookie bitch ass commentators on Twitter. Oh. I don't understand it. You not fooling a libertarian by bringing up the bitch ass roles. <laughs> How many times? Is it that we oppose, we say we oppose taxation, and the first goddamn level one rookie, childish, kindergarten-ass, bitch-made argument that you throw out there is what about the roads? You must drive on the roads. You must hate the roads. You think we ain't fit of all the things that could stop Libertarians, which tend to be smarter people, they tend to get there by way of economic reasons. And you think, you somehow think that the thing that's going to stump us and be like, damn, fuck this libertarian shit, is the motherfucking roads. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Walter Block has a long form write up of the privatization, privatization of roads and highways. This is level one shit. Just because maybe you can't figure it out, which is okay. This is why we're for free markets. It's because you can't figure out how minus taxation, people would say, damn, I need to get over there. What if we built a goddamn flat space? If you think people can't figure that shit out, or you can't figure out how people would do that, so you, 
That's okay. This is why we're free market. Let the smart people kind of figure that shit out and allocate those resources. But I promise you, homies, you're not fooling now libertarian by bringing up them bitch-ass roads. Fuck them hoe-ass roads, man. Well, wow, libertarians really hate roads. They really, really do hate roads. Uh, and um, but if here's, Trump gets reelected, now, I'm going to become a libertarian. I have, uh, I, I, of course, I've interviewed uh, Walter Block multiple occasions, and people can go back and make their own assessments as to Walter the soundness of Walter Block's arguments. Uh, but uh, Mr. July, um, he doesn't offer any. He just says it's very remedial. Now, I don't think the idea is that we're trying to fool libertarians by bringing up roads it is and it is incredibly um a uh, fundamental and rudimentary in many respects because you walk out of your house and you see a road and uh you say to yourself how did it get there now um i believe that um mr july uh, thinks that well making a road is easy and and, and it is to a to a certain extent it, it's it's not a it's not a horribly complicated a physics problem on how to make a road. Um, and in fact, we all have, not all, but many, many of us Americans have a, a relationship with private roads. And for the most part, for the most part, we call them driveways. And uh, everyone can figure out how we make a driveway. But the point is the driveway does lead to a road. And, uh, for those of us who have spent some time living in rural areas, um, on dirt roads, and then uh, have actually watched the process of these roads over time maybe becoming paved, we understand why some roads would never, ever get built. Because when, when uh, Mr. July is talking about the allocation of resources, um, he is saying that the smart people will allocate resources in a way, and they will. But the smart people, as he calls them, which I would suggest in a libertarian world would be defined by something like how much money is in your bank account. That's an indication of how smart you are. The smart people would only build roads that benefit them. And now, now that benefit could be... Uh, broader than just I need a road to my my house and my gated community with my paramilitary that's there waiting for me. It could also be like I need a road for the serfs so that they can bring me, uh, you know, uh, tribute. The, tribute or uh, you know, yeah, Grain. grains, <laughs> whatever it is. But what of the serfs that live too far or what of the serfs who, who are saying, I don't want to give you grains? Uh, I just want to live my life here. But, of course, I need access to other people on some level. I mean, that's the whole point. We could privatize the post office. We could privatize the road system. The road system, but it's I think it's undeniable. And Even someone as uh, mentally challenged as myself in talking who, who to Mr. July. To bitch ass argument. Yes. Ho ass. I, For ho ass roads, which you're so, obsessed someone with. Someone for me who... Who, who has an affinity for the B asterisk, 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 A asterisk, asterisk roads. Um, uh, I, I would say that it's undeniable that we would have fewer roads. Now, maybe that would be a good thing, but it wouldn't necessarily be a public policy uh, decision if it was based upon private uh, funding. It would only benefit those people with money. And 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 the same with the post office. You're from uh, South uh, North Dakota, correct, Matt? That's correct. Yep. There's really no reason for us to have postal service to, to North Dakota. I think, largely uh, speaking, and in many areas, I would imagine it's fairly remote. But they, short of uh, of Indian reservations. There's postal service uh, that is relatively uh, convenient to all of you. Maybe got to go down to the local post office, but you know what? You, I, if I had to allocate resources in a way that was just about pure f market efficiency, probably not. I'll say getting Sorry, deliveries is more dependable in uh, my hometown than it is in Brooklyn sometimes. Well, I mean, uh, that does it, not surprise me because nobody has a buzzer. 
Well, the 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 point being that um, smart people, and I don't know how he's defining smart people, would allocate resources only in a way that benefits them, and they would be, they would determine benefit not based upon things like a civic society or providing the um, the most opportunity to as many people, but it would be rather how can I accrue more than those around me, thereby increasing my purchasing power, my power, broadly speaking, in society. And so um, those bitch ass roads, um, uh, what they indicate and the reason why they are one of the first things that come up is because it, it basically is a, a, a perfect manifestation of a value system that says we want to include everyone in society, that everyone in some way has the capacity and the ability um, to contribute to society, even if they're not doing so at that very moment, and that everyone should in some way, because of the social contract that we have, uh, everyone should enjoy at least a basic minimum. And we argue over what the basic minimum is of of the uh the output of society and that's why and that's why it comes up first but just because it comes up first doesn't mean we're trying to fool anybody it's just that libertarians have a very difficult time to answer it and i don't care if walter block has written an entire book on it i've spent a, a decent amount of time talking to walter block and you know and i then gotta they say could go to a fifth court and then you flip a coin on the seventh but court. but i want to make By this this a, time we an invitation the of consent. I want to remind, this is just a, a, a periodical reminder, end of the year in 2019, if you're a libertarian and you want to discuss any of this or any other issues, you can call in at 646-257-3920, or you can tweet at us and we will always endeavor to have you on the program and discuss uh, uh, those topics, and you can really start true. by telling me Jesus. what kind of libertarian you are and how there's no <laughs> other libertarians that know what they're talking about, and then and then we can take it from there. Some libertarians think this and this. Isn't it a problem for you, Sam, though, that potholes have been extinct for a year and a half? <laughs> Don't you remember? I mean, I, nobody's seen a pothole for a year and a half. I, of... Nobody. Oh, boom. Oh, oh yes, we pizza. did. There you go. Potholes have gone away. So when general. you read the Domino's example, I think you realize that your obsession with ho-ass roads have been revealed as another liberal totalitarian boondoggle. <laughs> The end. Yes. Um, Just for the record, libertarian socialists are really good at roads. What is going on with Rudy Giuliani now? <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's do a couple of these and then we'll go back to the debate. There was a couple other things about the debate that we should probably talk about, but... Um, this is crazy. So Rudy Giuliani, I mean, I, I, there's definitely some, there's some internal strum and drang. I don't know how you say that, uh, in, in the, uh, Trump administration. And there is a feeling that Rudy is like, he's half playing for the president and half playing for himself at this point. And to some respect, like that is the beauty of the conservative movement. Yeah. At the end of the day, um, they're all playing for themselves on some level. It's about the individual. And the they are fortunate in that they all share an agenda of like just fleecing as many people as possible and increasing their wealth. And so there's less discord. You know, they, they are pursuing what our uh, libertarian friends would say, you know, like a, a pursuit of our own self-interest. And I think to a certain extent, the reason why libertarians think that uh, the pursuit of self-interest will uh, necessarily be a benefit for society writ large is because they are uh, because when they hang out with like minded people, they're all on the same page which is just we're I'm just going to make myself as wealthy as possible and there's no other values that are existing which is also why you know broadly speaking there are exceptions uh Mr. July is 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 one of those um why they share uh, such similar attributes in terms of where they are and sit in society um relative to 
uh, race or gender. Um, and but here is a Rudy Giuliani. He is speaking with Turning Points USA because, um, you know, Charlie Kirk wants to get in on this as well. And um, he is uh, basically laying the the groundwork. We are 11 months out now from the election. And um, this is this is like a twofold insurance policy, I think, that Rudy Giuliani has. One is. I'm providing an insurance policy for the president. What are we going to do if we lose the election? And two is, I'm providing a, an insurance policy for myself. What am I going to do if the president turns on me? This is America. You, you, know, you know where that happens. That happens in countries where there are dictatorships. And they're moving us in that direction. The whole impeachment process just trashed the Constitution. No right to counsel, no right to call witnesses, no right of confrontation, no right to even have your lawyer there and investigate all the lawyers. Pause it. They want to put bar. One second. Now, first off, they're me- moving towards dictatorship. Um, it, it, the congressional dictatorship you rarely see. Uh, it's usually invested in one person who is at the top of. But. Um, <laughs> And this is the big talking point, that there is no opportunity for uh, the president to call witnesses or to meet his accusers or whatever it is. And, of course, it is Mitch McConnell who is preventing that right now in the Senate. Senate. In fact, uh, Nancy Pelosi feels so strongly that uh, President Trump should have the opportunity to defend himself that she's withholding the articles of impeachment to allow them the opportunity. Now, maybe um, Rudy Giuliani hasn't gotten the, the message yet. Maybe he can't hear it. Uh, this guy's turning into Mr. Magoo very quickly. No right to even have your lawyer there and investigate all the lawyers. They want to put Barr in prison and they want to execute me. Good luck, by the way. The mafia tried that. And the FARC. Should the mafia, longer. the FARC, and the word you can't say, Islamic extremist terrorists have all taken out contracts of one kind or another to kill me. And my answer is, good luck. I just get angrier and I go after you more. And you, sir, you're a pretender. (laughs) Um, I'm a big fan of the FARC. I just, apropos of nothing, I just would like to have that out on the public record. I would like to see the contract that was put out on Rudy Giuliani by Islamic, uh, extreme Islamic terrorists or whatever he calls them. And uh, frankly, I would also like to see a little bit more digging around on uh, the mafia's contract on him, because I would imagine there might be one by one group that we would call the mafia. But I suspect that there might be other groups that are also maybe not so uh, concerned with getting rid of sort of like different kinds of contracts. You mean like. Maybe there was a contract from the Medellin cartel to assassinate General Noriega if they thought he was skimming. But maybe there was another uh, different organization that provided him security. Exactly. I mean, (laughs) just different contracts. Right. There's just different relationships with different groups. Maybe as an example, you build a whole career uh, based on destroying one type of mafia that you might even be ethnically identified with. Just at exactly the same time that it opens up the door for another type of mafia to dominate New York City. And literally every day in the news, we hear about you having different potential and alleged bizarre relationships with that other mafia. Das Vidanya. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Isn't this uh, kind of what the Irishman is about? And yeah. Yeah. Do terrorists really put out contracts on That's people? what I was saying. Like, I feel yeah, like they I don't, don't really do a lot of outsourcing. That's right. Let's put the contract on him. He'll use it in Switch a TPA speech right. and make an ass of himself. Um, First of all, what do we got, Ben Shapiro? Women doing? should cover and Send second, us off. we want a, a contract on Rudy Giuliani. Uh, can I, but I also, the only serious point I make is that all right wing politics is projection. And that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. And that's like a serious point. Um, so Ben P- uh, Shapiro, he of the um, he is sort of like a, the self-appointed pope of the Jews. Um, oh. Right. We could do a lot better than that. He's but young yes, Jew pope. Yes. He is. He, he, he is. He, well, he's the young Jew pope. 
he don't he, speak to me in a familiar way. He <laughs> thinks that he has the ability in his really bizarre form of Judaism that he can determine who is a good Jew and a bad Jew. He said this many, many times before. He's uh, used the phrase "gino" and uh, uh, yeah, Jew in name only. Jew in name only. Um, and but he's also said that you know you're you're a bad Jew if you support Democrats, um, and which you know uh, you'd have to dig pretty deep into uh, to the uh, the teachings at Yavna to find that. But uh, it's there. So uh, the majority of American Jews are bad. Right, exactly uh, as Rabbi Akiva said. Uh, but here is, but even Rabbi Akiva was not um, was not the Pope of the Jews like uh, Ben Shapiro is. But Ben now is going to explain to us the um, the prominence of the fetus and how uh, the fetus is far more relevant than uh, a fully born woman who, of course, Fucking a. just comes from the <laughs> rib of Adam, anyways. So, Michelle Wolf. Championing the abortion. I mean, this is a shift in the language, in the tone, in the tenor of the left. And then you wonder why evangelical Christians support President Trump. You don't have to like President Trump's treatment of women. You don't have to like the fact that he says nasty things about people. You don't have to like a lot of things about the dude. But if the alternative is a Democratic Party that thinks that that is funny, a Democratic Party and an entire political wing of the United States that cheers and laughs, when a human being says about the killing of an unborn human being that that killing made her feel powerful like God, like that's, <laughs> I will vote for pretty much anything before I vote for anybody who laughs at that joke. I mean, that, like really, I'll vote for pretty much, and, and evangelical Christians feel the same. See, what the left wants to do is say you have no moral standards if you vote for President Trump because President Trump is a bad man who's done bad things. Okay, well, then what does it make you to vote for people who want abortion on demand all the way up to point of birth and who refuse to even acknowledge the humanity of a baby five seconds before it comes through a mother's vaginal canal? <laughs> and you're you're going to have to explain that one to me. Which is more immoral, voting for a president who has allegedly sexually harassed women or voting for somebody who has pledged to make abortion on demand not only legal across the country but celebrated in our culture? Which seems worse in terms of politics? I'm not talking about who you'd rather have babysit your kid. I'm not talking about who you'd rather go to dinner with. I'm talking about the fundamental principles at stake when you talk about partisan politics. In an environment like this, an environment that's polarized, this is why, unless the Democrats were willing to push forward an impeachment that was actually supportable by facts, unless they were willing to push forward an impeachment that was so overwhelming in its, in its criminal standards of proof, this was going nowhere from the outset. Because if you think that anyone is going to go along with the Michelle Wolf wing, simply because President Trump doesn't know how to talk on phone calls and says dumb crap a lot. You are thinking about this thing all wrong. All right. What is oh this kid talking about? Let me explain. Let me, let me translate. Out of your mouth, Ben Shapiro. <laughs> let, let, me, let me translate. Ben Shapiro saw, saw a skit by Michelle Wolf, who is a comedian, and uh, wherein uh, she was saying that uh, she was empowered by having the ability to have an abortion. And therefore, uh, there's no way Republicans are going to vote in the Senate for impeachment <laughs> because of the Michelle Wolf wing of the Democratic Party. <laughs> <laughs> or, 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 or as we refer to it here as the primary Democratic caucus. That's right. Um, I mean, I, honestly, and, is this a new genre of triggering the cons? Exactly. And, like, and, what the hell? Well, first off, first off, there's uh, there's there's no one who's saying like abortion on demand uh, five seconds before birth. Um, that is was not the case. It is not available to anyone uh, in the only instance where you would have any type of abortion even cl remotely close to the end of a term of pregnancy uh, would have to do with a life threatening situation for the mother. Um, Oops, this is, I changed my mind five is, seconds before birth. Right, exactly. Uh, I, I've carried it uh, eight months, and now it's like, mm, I'm just going to do this because Michelle Wolf told me to do it. Did you hear about but the Elizabeth Warren psych bill? Right. Exactly. And then you say, psych to the kid, five seconds away. You go, gosh darn it, I'm aborting you, even though you're about to come out of the vag vaginal canal. Because I, I thought that would trigger Ben Shapiro. But the the idea that... The that a fetus, 
and he wants to call it an unborn human being. Well, I mean, it's it's a fetus. There's actually like a you know, it's it's about facts, not your emotions, <laughs> not your feelings about it. It's simply about a fact, Ben. And um, but the idea that he would just blow off the notion of like, OK, he's been alleged to have molested 43 women. What possible impact could that have on our politics? The idea like, because it's also let's be clear. If you look at the Republicans in the uh, Senate and the House of Represent- uh, Representatives, I don't know that there's anybody in this room who has been alive at a time where there has been less female representation in the Republican Party. Never mind white people, the exclusive representation of, of I mean, near exclusive. I think it's probably, I don't know, 3% of the electeds in, in the House might be African-American, black. Oh, among the, among among the Republicans. Republicans? Like, maybe less. I think it's less. Well, it could be less. I mean, Heard, heard he's going to retiring. Mia, I thought Scott, Mia, Tim Scott. Mia Love or Mia Long lost her seat. I, Mia Love gave me no love. No she love. Lost her seat. That's our Tim Scott. Tim Scott in the Senate. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the idea that the, the president having total dis- disregard for women so much so that he feels that he can grope them uh, because he can get away with any of it. Um, His total disregard then becomes the justification for anything that Donald Trump does. So in other words, there is nothing. There is nothing. There is no position a Republican president can take. There is nothing a Republican Avenue. He could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue. If you are in any way surprised because you have comedians making rude jokes about abortion, that's why Donald Trump should be allowed to do anything. So he he both he basically and he's also saying like in the political world. He has taken this uh, comedian, who's been elected by no one, uh, and, and put put them into uh, politics in his regard because he wants the broader culture to be defined by who we elect as as a president, as opposed to keeping it about rights. I mean, this guy talks about. It's about facts and not feelings. His entire project is about feelings. His entire project. Self-victimology and self-justification. And I just, I think, I mean, I also think that it it is interesting to me that he did not say, like, he downgraded it. He didn't say allegations of being a rapist. Like, even there, that's a, that's a word choice, you know. Of course. Yeah, he chickened out. Of course. Well, yeah, why not go full boat? I want to know exactly what they would, what uh, Ben Shapiro, the Pope of the Jews, Popes of the Good Jews, uh, thinks is okay and inexcusable if you have people like this comedian Michelle Wolf around. Like, what, what, what the are they allowed to do? The little Jew kid said that I could nuke Mongolia because she made a very bad joke. Very bad joke. And it was very rude and it was terrible. And we're nuking my God. And that's what's at stakes with our and that's partisan that's politics. Stake. Yeah. I mean, that's the, this is like, I, I, it really actually is so frustrating to me because I, I do think like Doug Lane, who's, you know, disclosures, my publisher, but like, I agree with him. He's somebody on the left who is, it takes, you know, free speech. You want to call it. That's another word that's been destroyed by these people extremely seriously. And I've migrated much closer to that position, but like, this idiot constantly making disingenuous, whiny claims about this, and then literally is not only endorsing cancel culture over comedy, but extending it to a a blank check to support a president doing literally anything because of a joke. I mean, cancel culture for thee, not for me. But it's beyond cancel culture. That that's not even. I mean that that is literally. I don't. I couldn't even think of the in. It's like. Well, I heard, you know, I don't know, Nick DiPaolo made a joke, so I give myself permission to do hit and runs in Westchester. <laughs> That's right. I'm if a- Nick DiPaolo is making these kinds of jokes, then we should definitely be locking up Bill Barr and executing Rudy That's Giuliani. Exactly. That's it. As a political program. Yeah. You know, I, I, you may not like that the FARC have a hit on Rudy Giuliani, but Nick DiPaolo mocking a black activist that was killed. All bets are off. 
Okay, the FARC can do whatever they want. Fast and Furious would be a big problem under Obama. <laughs> if, if, if Nick DiPaolo or that Norton guy hadn't made such rude jokes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Norton's still on serious. And anyways, my point is, is Did that you see all that first series born 24? white males need to be castrated. That series 24, that's why Benghazi's okay. Because they're putting out TV shows and doing that show like 24. Right. So Benghazi. Pff. You know what? Keith or Sutherland, he, they think torturing uh, uh, terrorist suspects is a joke. And you know what? You might not like that the intelligence officers in Benghazi were killed, but guess what? All bets are off. <laughs> Forget 24 it. was super offensive. <laughs> <laughs> you may have thought 9-11 was bad, but Rambo was super in bad taste That's right. about yeah. Afghanistan. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's saying. I was just going to go out on a limb and say that uh, Ben Shapiro doesn't need jokes to uh, pose abortion. God, it I is would... funny to look at, to watch him grasping for more and more uh, cultural pegs. As right. Well, exactly. It's, it's you're totally right. But this is all that you know. He's like the millennial moral scold, and I think in 2016, like he did a whole like. And if, this was also hilarious because he literally said, like, Andrew Breitbart would never do this. I mean, Andrew Breitbart would be having – I don't want to say because it it's disgusting, but Andrew Breitbart would have been ecstatic about Donald Trump. So that was – it was ridiculous. But he did leave Breitbart and say Bannon was bad and all this stuff. And he – I don't know if he was a never-Trumper, but I think he might have been like a – I live in – he might have even been like a I live in California. I'm going to cast a protest vote guy. And so – it's more subtle than Beck because Beck has a down market and he just needed to drop all of that crap if he wanted his career to survive. But Shapiro also needs to be a Trumpist to have a mainstream right. appeal. Of so, course. But he's got to always find, like, still some... do this like, well, I still object because, right. of course, I'm super moralistic. Donald Trump is horrible. However, right. Michelle Wolf making these jokes is just a little bit more horrible enough to get me to the place where I need to be. Well... It is a thought process that a lot of uh, evangelical Christian voters go through. Like they are disgusted by Trump and the rape stuff and the swears and his rudeness and crudeness. But if you really believe abortion is murder and that's like your first priority, then you're going to vote for him. I, I would also, though, argue that um, none of them would have ever heard of Michelle Wolf were it not for uh, for for Ben Shapiro. I no disrespect to Michelle Wolf. She's a very funny, talented person. But I like. I mean, I, I have not heard. I, I think she was on Rogan a couple of months ago, and I knew that because it was a suggested YouTube video that I didn't click on. No offense to anybody. Uh, yeah. Also, I think a lot of evangelicals do not care even remotely. They're more like Kenny McBride than like yeah. actual pious right. people. Right. I think that's true. <laughs> or, uh, uh, All right. Kevin McBride. Let's just uh, l play this uh, clip from uh, this guy. Is he still? Oh, he's a Daily Wire host, right? This guy? Uh, Michael Knowles. Ooh. Oh, how dare wow. you? Wow. How you come Dude's near ticking. my brand with your trash. <laughs> so, uh, I'll sue everybody. <laughs> this, but unironically. I now, swear to God, imagine if I beg from the Daily the, Wire over a petty IP dispute. This guy is the comedian <laughs> on, right? He's the comedian. He's the funny one. Uh, I think so. I think on the Daily the Wire. Cool, so it's guy. fun to tune in every now and then just to find out what, um, what these guys are convinced is funny. And uh, here it is. Uh, this is his, the comic stylings of Michael Knowles. They did it. The Democrats have impeached President Trump. So what happens now? At this point, I'm actually half hoping that the Senate convicts just so that President Pence can then institute a full-on Handmaid's Tale style dystopian Puritan tyranny. Not because anybody wants that to happen, least of all Mike Pence, but just because <laughs> it would totally own the libs. Can you imagine how hilarious that would be? I mean, it would be dystopian, obviously, but it would be absolutely hilarious. They think they impeach Trump and they think because they've never read the Constitution that that means that now Hillary Clinton is going to be president. And then just peeking out from behind the curtain is uh, Mike Pence there just passing out bonnets left and right. That would make it almost all worthwhile, though I say 
almost because this actually is sort of a sad thing. All right, pause it for one second. I just want to get this like I, I listen, you know, um, nobody likes it when you deconstruct a joke uh, and nobody likes it when you have to explain a joke. That's not funny. But um, it's a tiny I'm a bit funny. Well, I don't understand the concept of why would Mike Pence do this? If he didn't want to do it, because why couldn't can't, Donald can't Trump even, just do it? He can't even. Right. Be, I, well, good point. But I think <laughs> that he can. But actually, look, I, I, I can't even go there. I just need to make a serious point because I found that so disgusting and offensive. And I can no longer condemn the terrorist that shot Steve Scalise in the hip. <laughs> because because right, right. following Ben Shapiro's logic, that joke about terrorizing half of the population in a sci fi dystopia if you, if you actually laugh is, at that and you think that's funny, you actually I'll laugh at that. You. you think that's funny? I can't say that going to a baseball field is wrong. Right. I can't. You might think it's stupid crap to do, and I do, but I can't condemn it. All right, let's just. I want to see this. Uh, this is uh, Michael Knowles' acting uh, reel. Just uh, let's let's see this baby. And you're a uh, you're an actor. You're, you're acting, huh? Holy shit! What the fuck, Nicole? <laughs> Not what you think. Not what I think. Are you fucking your brother? No. Ah! I, I wish I could do that. What? Oh, I like it when you're rough with me, pretty lady. Hmm? Oh, that does not mean anything, okay? Sometimes I wish the elderly would just die. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Great start work. Quit it. This is some serious shit. You're just fucking writing serious shit. He's mad. Do fucking worse than that. Is that a threat? That's a promise, sucker. What are you going to say? You can be obsessed with your sister. I'm adopted, remember? That makes it better. Bear a tenor. I damn near killed him. <laughs> Who is she? It's like a stock joke. Guys, shut the fuck 30 up. 30 days. Guys, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come so All right, this is a little longer than I was hoping it would be. I uh, mean, look, we get it. <laughs> some fine work. Uh, All right, I'm just going to take some IMs today. Uh, we're going to wrap up in about 20 minutes. Um, we got a couple more uh, clips to go through through the uh, debate, but um, uh, we don't have time for calls, and I don't want to. F- I feel bad ending 2019 with people on, you know, 40 people on hold. So we'll do IMs only. Uh, Tom Cat. Hi, guys. Even though I'm really feeling bad after the disastrous UK election, I'm inspired to continue the fight for a left Britain. Tonight, I'm at a local momentum meeting to decide what we're going to do over the coming weeks and months. It's obvious we need a well-supported, connected, left, independent media base in the world, but especially the UK. If anyone fancies doing an MR-type show or podcast over here, I have a music tech uh, production qualification can be used. Just saying, anyway, Merry Christmas, and thank you for all you do. Um, yeah, I... I, I I mean, I, I, do people come into contact with shows like that, like YouTubers in Britain? I mean, like an MR of, U, of yeah. the UK. Now, Vara Media does some very good work. Yeah, but I don't there. think they're not. They're not. A, I, as far as I know, their video product isn't at our level. Um, I mean, there's like that l- uh, leading Britain's conversation thing that like had a whole bunch like from Owen Jones to Nigel yeah. Farage, but. I got to really recommend, I know it's different, but I really, honestly, Tribune is really, really good. It is written, but that's something I would definitely join. Uh, is that the because, one that Jacobin bought? Yes. I mean, because Jacobin has also been extremely important with the formation of all the stuff here. But I, I, I think I think there does need to be a lot more of that type of thing in the UK. Yeah, I, there I needs to be some true. cross-pollination. Good, some good... Like we had on Aaron Bastani from Navarra Media on the Antifada a little bit ago, and I would like to do more of that kind of thing. Rick from Florida. I have always been puzzled by Tulsi's support, so I decided to look at the coverage of her on various independent left-wing YouTube shows. Naturally, I started with the leader of the dumb, dumb left, Jimmy Dore, and to nobody's surprise, he has almost 60 videos on her where she is supposedly (laughs) destroying her critics or being smeared by the media. And literally every title is meant to signal positive vibes about Tulsi in some way or another. Went to check his latest videos, assuming he would have one defending her abstaining on the impeachment vote and somehow got her to come on her sh- his show for an interview to explain her stance. 
I, I feel proud of myself about that. Keep in mind, this is a presidential candidate, and this is two days after her controversial decision. To me, that says everything you need to know about her. I mean, I'm suspect of that. This is that that to me, this is red flaggy all over the place. Indeed. Don't be a hater. Is there a list of Matthews film recommendations uh, somewhere? Yes. Letterbox. We'll put a link in uh, today's uh, description. Chrissy Boy, we're organizing a Casaralezo, a.k.a. A, a noise demonstration here in uh, OKC. What is that? Oklahoma City. Uh, if you all could shout it out. Conditions in the Oklahoma County Jail are horrific, and the sheriff is cooperating with ICE. Um, Oklahoma City DSA will be co-sponsors of the event. Any interested Okies would like to reach out for more info on January 1st uh, at uh, uh, Oklahoma County Jail. So check out the uh, Oklahoma City DSA. Screaming into the void movie recommendation, The Report, streaming on Prime. Listen to Jeremy Scahill's intercepted interview with the real Dan Jones, who led the Senate investigation in the CIA torture, a.k.a. enhanced interrogation. Amazing episode. Uh, goth Koala. Sam, last night while you were watching Pete doing his stage moves, you told the crew to remind you to do a comedy bit you used to do in the 90s. What was your bit? Oh, yeah, okay. This is my... Um, oh, well, do we have anything of Pete? Do we have anything else of uh, Pete or no? Um, we have Bernie dunking on him. Uh, do Bernie dunking on Let's him. Let's do Bernie uh, dunking on him. That will inspire This is three, and then it gets to Bernie dunking on him later, so. Okay. Three to four. Pete, I apologize. I'm going to be dunking on you as well. All right, so this is from the uh, debate last night. We'll start with uh, Warren and Buttigieg uh, having at it over closed-door fundraising. And um, I think, like, the um, the net of this is is it— is a negative for Buttigieg in part because in the broader context of the evening, it was just one more instance where people were signaling that they don't like Pete Buttigieg on the stage. And I think that gets communicated to people. Um, There is a substantive critique that Buttigieg makes of Warren, which is that while she has said she will do no uh, big donor fundraisers in the democratic primary for president, She did raise such money in her senatorial campaign and moved it over uh, about $10 million, in my understanding, over from that uh, war chest into her presidential campaign. Now, um, I think the biggest problem with this, in my mind, is just like it's hard to, you know, get a lot of mileage out of that when you have done that. I don't know that there's uh, there anything just going going for a wrong with that um, uh, per se. I don't know who those donors were, uh, you know, uh, in particular, but it's just um, it's a hard road to to, to hoe, as it were. Uh, but um, Buttigieg, I think, like I say, in the end, comes off uh, the worst in this because of uh, not just this moment, but because it's consistent with a lot of moments over the course of the debate. And everybody gets one vote. But here's the thing. People who can put down $5,000 to have a picture taken don't have the same priorities as people who are struggling with student loan debt or are struggling to pay off medical debt. I want, I'm running a campaign where people whose voices get heard. We can't have, Thank you, Senator Warren. We can't World. have people who can put down $5,000 for a check, drown out the voices of everyone else. Thank you, Senator They Warren. don't in my campaign, and they Mayor won't Buttigieg. in my White House. Mayor Buttigieg, you had your hand raised. Oh. Can't help but feel that might have been directed at me. And here's the thing. Pause it. This is a problem for Pete Buttigieg, uh, because... If someone just randomly says or just in general says, and maybe it was directed at him, but she for the vast majority of people out there watching this, I don't think they thought it was necessarily directed at him. But when somebody says, hey, money corrupts. And if you're taking money from uh, millionaires and billionaires, it's corruptive of you. And uh, particularly sounds like con- you're talking about me. And he goes, <laughs> that was obviously about me. Oh, why would you think that? Yeah, exactly. Here. And here's the thing. We're in the fight of our lives right now. Donald Trump and his allies have made it abundantly clear that they will stop at nothing, not even foreign interference to hold on to power. They've already put together 
more than $300 million. This is our chance. This is our only chance to defeat Donald Trump. And we shouldn't try to do it with one hand tied behind our back. The way we're going to win is to bring everybody to our side in this fight. If that means that you're a grad student digging deep to go online to PeteForAmerica.com and chip in 10 bucks, that's great. And if you can drop $1,000 uh, without blinking, that's great, too. We need everybody's help in this fight. I'm not going to turn away anyone who wants to help us defeat Donald Trump. We need Democrats who've been with us all along, yes, but we also need independents worried about the direction of the country. If you were a Republican, disgusted with what's going on in your own party, we're not going to agree on everything, but we need you in this fight, and I will welcome you to our side. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hey, Senator Warren, 45 seconds to respond. So the mayor just recently had a fundraiser that was held in a wine cave full of crystals and served $900 a bottle wine. Um, think about who comes to that. Look at it, he look had at look promised on his face. that every fundraiser he would Killer. do would be open door, but mm. this one was closed door. We made the decision Look at the many years ago <laughs> yes, that rich exactly. people Those in smoke-filled rooms hands. would not pick the next president of the United States. Billionaires in wine caves should not pick the That's next awesome. president of the United States. Mr. Mayor, your okay. response. You know, okay. according to Forbes magazine, I am the, literally the only person on this stage who's not a millionaire or a billionaire. Pause it for one second. Now, we should also add... That he is on stage with uh, at least half the people who are twice his age. And if there is any doubt that this guy is going to be a millionaire in 10, 20 years or, you know, I, I, then I would eat my hat. Bullshit. I was eating compost when I was your age, young man. <laughs> It's true, actually. Yeah, well, also, he was arguing a second ago that we shouldn't give free college to the children of billionaires. Right. And now he's saying that he is the class background of his current net worth and not that of his parents. So, like, which is it, Pete? Right. That's a good point. So if this is important, this is the problem with issuing purity tests you cannot yourself pass. If I pledge never to be in the company of a progressive Democratic donor, I couldn't be up here. Senator, your net worth is 100 times mine. Now, supposing that you went home feeling the holiday spirit, I know this isn't likely, but stay with me, and decided to go on to mm. PeteForAmerica.com and give the maximum allowable by law, $2,800. Would that pollute my campaign because it came from a wealthy person? No, I would be glad to have that support. Pause it one more second. The issue isn't that people put went online and donated $2,800. I don't think anybody would really take much of an wine issue with that. Cave. The issue is, is that they're in a wine cave, that you're actually selling them, literally selling them access. That's the issue. Access to the wine cave. In fact, you know, like, I, I, the, real, the real reform should be like, we only accept donations online. And we have no contact with donors. Or, or we have no private contact. I mean, that's really the issue. I mean, that's why they, they won't open up the... Uh, that's why you won't open up the, some fundraisers. Can I just say really quick, though, stylistically, I think, unfortunately, among some people, that kind of argument works. Like, that's sort of like, well, how could you say that? Because you're rich yourself, right. blah, blah, blah. So that's a decent direction tactically for him to go in, of which he totally spoils by just that dickish digression yeah he can't i, I have no idea why he would do yeah say that thing about like you not yeah, that's have well, holiday spirit it's Weird. like i think it, it, it it's actually a maturity thing it, yeah it's totally well, i think part of it is also that there's probably the, the in there you know well, when they sit down with the facebook people that uh, advise his campaign they probably also say like oh you also got to show you're tough and that you can you can dish it out in the way that you can take it good the support from everybody who is committed to helping Beauty. us defeat Donald Trump. Beauty. Beauty. <laughs> we would. We would like to bring in everyone, but obviously, Senator Warren, I'd like to give you a chance to respond. I do not sell access to my time. I don't do call time Hold with millionaires second. and billionaires. Sorry, as of I when, don't Senator? Meet, I don't meet behind closed doors with big dollar donors. 
And look, I've taken one that ought to be an easy step for everyone here. I've said to anyone who wants to donate to me, if you want to donate to me, that's fine. But don't come around later expecting to be named ambassador. Because that's what goes on in these high-dollar fundraisers. I said no, and I asked everybody on this stage to join me. This ought to be an easy step. And here's the problem. If you can't stand up and take the steps that are relatively easy, can't stand up to the wealthy and well-connected when it's relatively easy, when you're a candidate, then how can the American people believe you're going to stand up to the wealthy and well-connected when you're president and it's really hard? Judy. Senator, Mr. Oh, Senator, I've got to respond to this. Oh, hey, Mr. Mayor, we're going to give you one more chance to respond. If you can't say no to a donor, then you have no business running for office in the first place. But also, Senator, your presidential campaign right now, as we speak, is funded in part by money you transferred, having raised it at those exact same big-ticket fundraisers you now denounce. Did it corrupt you, Senator? Of course not. So to denounce the same kind of fundraising guidelines that... President Obama went by, that Speaker Pelosi goes by, that you yourself went by until not long ago in order to build the Democratic Party and build a campaign ready for the fight of our lives. These purity fight tests shrink the stakes of the most important election. Judy, we, we like to bring everyone in. We like to okay, bring now, if, if I was Warren and I was going to pursue this, I would have probably... Um, uh, appreciated that 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 Buttigieg may go there. And I think I would have probably used that last, um, you know, and it's very easy to sit here in this, you know, completely non-pressured environment uh, and and, and say this. But uh, this is, you know, part of what her campaign should be preparing her for. And and look, this is, again, why in, in certain circumstances, things are just easier for Bernie because he has had the exact same Basically, through line his entire career, he hasn't done anything different. She should have taken the opportunity, realized, gotten sort of a whiff, particularly after he said since when, uh, Senator, and gotten the idea like, OK, I see where he's going here. She should have said, look, when I was senator earlier in my career, I did some of these things and I raised a little bit of money. We've transferred it into our presidential fund, but I realize how corrupting it is. Because I was late to this in life. You know, I became a senator because I was really, it was an academic and then an activist. Right. There's a, I wasn't planning on doing this you since build I was in a the child. Critique, you build in the critique. You say, I learned. That's one of the benefits of my experience. Right. But to go out on your, cam- on your first presidential campaign and have them own you from the beginning of your career because, you know, you're not running for mayor. Of South Bend, you know, this is where this is where. Well, and incidentally, why are all of your fundraising records uh, under lock and key right. from your time as the mayor of a college town? Right. I mean, this is uh, I, I think sometimes and, and and this is what was so impressive. And I think we have this clip of Bernie about Afghanistan. Yep, we must. That was amazing. Um, later, we may play this, but, but Bernie was called um, on his vote for the war in Afghanistan. And um, he just came out and said, yeah, I made a mistake. I have yeah. total respect for, for Barbara Lee who made the right call. I made the wrong call and uh, I've learned my lesson. And, and so instead of it being a liability, it becomes a strength. Yeah. I've learned from my mistakes. And that literally never happens in this kind of setting. Absolutely not. But but it also what it projects is it projects a lot of of confidence and it's much better for you to bring up the critique or at least address it in real time than to allow your opponent to do it. Here is uh, here is uh, Bernie Sanders doing exactly that. He is owning the critique, accepting it and basically saying this is this is an argument for. The positions I have now are informed by the mistakes I've made before. Who doesn't Senator, appreciate that? Sanders, you, you do often point to your vote against the war in Iraq as evidence of your judgment on foreign policy, but you did vote for the war in Afghanistan. And as recently as 2015, you said you supported a continued U.S. troop presence there. Uh, was that support a mistake? Well, only one person, my good friend Barbara Lee, was right on that issue. She was the only person in the House to vote against the war in Afghanistan. She was right. I was wrong. So was everybody else in the House. 
But to answer your question, I don't think you do what Trump does and make foreign policy decisions based on a tweet at 3 a.m. in the morning or desert your longtime allies like the Kurds. I think you work with the international community. You remove all troops over a period of time, a short period of time within one year. I mean, that's that's that is the way that you deal with um, mistakes in your record. And, you know, every single person up there has those. Um, Obviously, the longer you have been in the Senate or the House, the more you have, uh, I would imagine, just statistically speaking. And that's one of the problems with Biden. Joe Biden will not acknowledge a single thing that he has ever done wrong in any context. He will not acknowledge that he screwed over um, uh, Anita Hill. He will not acknowledge that there were three women who were he would not allow to testify in those hearings against Clarence Thomas that would have corroborated at least uh, the behavior of Clarence Thomas. He will not acknowledge his failures on the bankruptcy bill. He will not acknowledge his failures on the war in Iraq. He will not uh, on and on and on and on. He will not acknowledge. All right, let's play this clip. Uh, This is Bernie Sanders. This is sort of the follow up to the uh, the clip where Warren and Buttigieg get into it about these closed door um, uh, fundraisers where uh, Buttigieg is uh, basically selling his access. And and I think Warren was trying earlier, you know, it, throughout the debate to sort of draw a distinction that she doesn't sell access. She gives selfies for free. But I just don't think people are savvy enough to know how that works with fundraisers and and, and what, what she's trying to draw there. I think it's actually a good mechanism, but they didn't do a good job of communicating oh, yeah. what it is because it, it assumes that we have this knowledge. Came but, off like a big humble brag. Well, it it came off as a humble brag, but it also didn't make sense because, I mean, frankly, like I'm savvy about this stuff and I didn't know that that's the parallel she was drawing. But this works really well for for Sanders, because this is, again, a moment where he shows he's trying to show it was clear Sanders was trying to show that he has a bit of a sense of humor. And it's a little bit self-deprecating. In that he acknowledges Pete Buttigieg is the youngest person in the um, uh, on the stage and that, you know, some people have some concerns with Bernie's age, but he manages to work that in. Uh, this is uh, this is a pretty good exchange where, where Sanders is talking about billionaire supporters. Um, Senator, Senator Sanders, I am rather proud. Maybe I don't know. The only candidate up here doesn't have any billionaire contributions. But you know what I do have? We have received more contributions from more individuals than any candidate in the history of the United States of America at this point in an election, averaging $18 a piece. Now, there's a real competition going on up here. My good friend Joe, and he is a good friend, he's received contributions from 44 billionaires. Pete, on the other hand, is trailing, Pete. You only got 39 billionaires contributing. So, Pete, we look forward to you. I know you're an energetic guy and a competitive guy to see if you can take on Joe on that issue. But what is not what is not a laughing matter, my friends, this is why three people own more wealth than the bottom half. This is why Amazon and other major corporations pay zero in federal taxes. There you go. I mean, that's that was great. Well done. Uh, Joe and Pete were so flat footed that he was going that yeah. like, like they did, quantitative on there. Yeah, ass. they were not ready for that. But Joe, like, I mean, honestly, I really so do pissed. think the Joe of 2000, I, I see it as the client. I think if you go back and look even just for a few minutes at him debate uh, Ryan. And it's totally depressing because the, you know, how, or actually, no, it's encouraging. Politics have opened up a lot since then. Yeah. But uh, the Joe Biden of 2012 would have, you know, he totally would have been like, you're a good friend, you know, too, even if you're saying malarkey or whatever. Right, right, exactly. Literally to like let the be there and be like, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Jerk. Pete Buttigieg knew that he needed to laugh at that. 
Whereas Joe Biden just went immediately to like, why I oughta. Exactly. Joe, totally. Joe immediately went to, how can I lie about this? I right, exactly. I'm going to need to cover on this. Um, he was like, I thought when they did the bingo cards with me, it was less billionaires. All right. Here's the bit that I used to do uh, in, or I don't know how many times I did it, but back in uh, the early 90s, based upon, I think it was the 92 campaign. I think it was probably based upon Bill Clinton. Sounds now that I right. think about it. And uh, because Clinton was the one where it became very clear that this is something that you use. Now, Buttigieg knows that this has become too clear that somebody's doing this. And so he does this where he's clear not to point because they tell you not to point to people. (laughs) And one of the things I did back when I was in comedy, (laughs) I would travel around the entire country and I would meet people, people like Mary Smith, who was a nurse. And she came to me and she said, Sam, I don't know how I'm going to cope. She said, I've got three kids. I'm a nurse. I don't know how I'm going to put food on their table. I don't know how I'm going to pay for their health (laughs) care. Every day, it's just a challenge to stay optimistic. (laughs) And I looked at her right in the eyes, and I said, Mary, I hear you. I don't care. I'm just a comedian. <laughs> That's not my. It's not my job. That actually would be very like. A, and I said, I don't care. I'm just trying to fulfill a lifelong right. child ambition of being president. It's just been my ambition. <laughs> That would be that's to what, be president, right? That's what Pete should say. That'd yeah. be very transparent. But I mean that 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 like it is so. Um, he is so plastic, and I think. I, I, I my my sense is you just don't have to be that um I, I you, you just don't have to be that savvy about this stuff to pick it up. No, and I, I don't think so at all. Even if you're not, I think the idea that everybody seems to hate him around them is just like one more sort of like uh I would think in the next couple of, of debates, it's going to be he's this dude's going to be the Ted Cruz. Of, I think uh, you're and I think twenty nineteen. I think it's very you're interesting because every everybody has. You know, there's personality preferences. Obviously, there's ideology. But you're at a point. I mean, I'll take the one, you know, obviously Klobuchar and Biden, right? Just, you know, on a policy level. But they they are actual human beings, whatever else you think. I mean, I, I don't know. But Buttigieg, or frankly, I mean, I feel bad, you know, Beto compared to Buttigieg. I think right. Beto at least yeah. is like a mammal. He's I mean, got, this guy got is a really. pathos to him. Yeah. As right. does Amy Klobuchar. I want to play one more clip. Uh, I think it's Biden how he explained with the GOP because he was lying here. But uh, and then and then we'll we'll read a couple of IMs and we'll get out of here. Um, uh, I, one thing that did occur to me is that when Bernie was saying that though that to uh, to uh, Biden and to um, uh, Buttigieg about I'm the only one up here who hasn't taken a billionaire money, I, I, Steyer would have been like, well, no billionaires have given. <laughs> <laughs> like he could nobody, have... nobody ever gave me money, Larry. <laughs> I mean, on some level, I think Steyer probably. It would not surprise me if Steyer was like the one guy up there. Like his billionaires, are like get the. Fu- I'm not yeah. gonna give you any money. I know how much money you got, dude. You don't need my money. Word. I don't think he. I mean, has he even taken any money? He's just spent his own money. Oh yeah, I think he's well. No, no, no. He's he needs to. He oh needs no, he's to gotten get people to, in there, but yeah, that was yeah. just because he was uh, mining uh, for right. emails. Right. But here is Joe Biden, and he, you know, there was a moment where Bernie Sanders is asked about the lack of diversity on the stage, and Bernie answered this question. It was one that came right after the last question that he had had was about climate change, and Bernie was making the point that. Climate change, the first victims of climate change are almost always, not almost always, I mean, we know that this is going to happen, are going to be um, people of color, are going to be the most marginalized in society. And 
the idea was like the question is like what you know what do we lose by not having diversity on the stage and what we lose by not having diversity on the stage is perspectives that make people aware of the implications of other things that they don't necessarily realize um uh how they impact people of color and and I do think that, you know, I, I think that Bernie can speak about these issues in a more expansive way. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that unless you've had some, you know, firsthand experience of it, it's it's less likely. It's not impossible, but it's less likely that you're going to have a perspective uh, that um, uh, about how people who are are different than you experience different things, right? Like, I mean, you know, we talk about the 1950s it was the heyday for the great compression where we, you know, and, but the fact of the matter is if you were, uh, you know, a black guy or a black woman living in just about everywhere in this country, the fifties are not such a great time, uh, uh, for you. I mean, we talk about social security, what well, kept uh, two thirds of people out of poverty. But the fact of the matter is if you were, um, a, um, a, uh, a, a, a farm worker, uh, a Latino farm worker or a, uh, a black man, um, uh, working on a farm or a, a, a black woman working as domestic worker, you're not covered by social security. And certainly nobody's, nobody's talking about that. Nobody's talking, they're not writing, you know, they're not big thought pieces at the time about that because nobody, you don't have access. Um, so Sanders, uh, Sanders started to answer with climate change. Let's play this clip. And no, I'm sorry. This is a different one. This is, um, this is uh, number two. Sanders started to, to, to answer in this way. And uh, he was, it was the only time we saw a moderator really basically say you didn't answer the question. And maybe there might have been one other time where that happened, but we never saw it within 20 seconds of them opening their mouth. And, and a whole she entire like, reparations answer yeah. from Joe Biden where he didn't – I don't think well, he even used the about word reparations. Listen, no, listen, Pete Buttigieg did not answer three or four questions. Right. And was not asked afterwards or before or during or whatnot. But this is sort of interesting because, I mean, you could you could take issue with Sanders' answer, but you got to let him at least answer. It's not like you're waiting that long. You only get uh, 75 seconds to answer. Tonight. Thank you, Mr. Yang. Senator Sanders, I do want to put the same question to you, Senator Sanders. What message do you think? I answer that question, but I wanted to get back to the issue of climate change for a moment because I do believe... This is the existential issue. Senator, with all respect, this question is about race. Can you answer the question as it was asked? This audience sucks. Because people of color, in fact, are going to be the people suffering most if we do not deal with climate change. And by the way, we have an obligation up here, if there are not any of our African-American brothers and sisters up here, to speak about an economy in which African-Americans are exploited, where black women die three times at higher rates than white women, where we have a criminal justice system which is racist and broken, disproportionately made up of African-Americans and Latinos and Native Americans who are in jail. So we need an economy that focuses on the needs of oppressed exploited people and that is the african-american community i mean i you know like i i i i'm not sure you know where bernie was going by by bringing it back to climate change but uh it appears that he was talking about you know the perspective on how their the, um, people of color are going to be most victimized by this i mean i think like i i think his language on this still can improve uh frankly and i think you know he he, I think, sees the way essentially that politics function in this country as being, uh, you know, that the the economy is inherently political. And I just don't know that, which I think is the case. I just don't know that the broad swaths of American people fully uh, understand that. Well, he has to make that, that case. I mean, I, let me I want to take 
really quick point. Uh, I do like what Brianna Joy Gray tweeted, which is don't go for a cheap dunk if you're not prepared to hear facts. Climate change is a racial justice issue, uh, which I thought was a very good yeah. response to that. But the other thing that I – the other two things, though, is is I would go from actually from – from both directions in a way, if you wanted to really tease out the critique. So one, I think there is obviously a conventional uh, centrist or whatever that is, is purely representational in the sense of the Adolf Reed critique, right? Which is that if the only choices in the world are between white supremacy capitalism and diverse capitalism, obviously we pick diverse capitalism. But we don't want a world where there are that levels of obscene inequality and exploitation. And basically what – the framework of some of these questions are simply who is just on the stage versus what their policy set is. And I think while that's valid, that does need to be pushed back on. On the flip side, where I'd actually criticize Sanders, and this is more uh, subtle, is I think part of the expression of that question and that focus, again, shows that you can't make essentialist claims about any community, period, because I think a lot of that interest comes from, as an example, people from, at least in my experience, like the African-American professional upper middle class who are not uh, oppressed in the economy the way Sanders is talking about, but do face, obviously, racial discrimination. Right. So I actually think that it, I have a problem on both sides of it because I, I have a problem with representation at the expense of politics and policy and the way it's always weaponized against Sanders. So I will always push back against that. But I actually think for Sanders to tease it out, he has to do a twofold, twofold track of doing some of the things you're talking about in terms of getting more specific. But then on the other hand, um, making those unitary economic arguments while also recognizing that, in fact, the upper class is not nearly diverse at all. But there is some diversity to it and that that is what is expressed right. in those That's questions. That's why I, I would like him to have said at one point, not necessarily the economy, but society. Right, and, right, right. I mean, it's a small – you know, it's like a, these are small tweaks and I think it's a function of just sort of like – I think both in practice and probably in terms of just actual like lived commitment, um, I think that his commitment to racial justice um, is, at least with the people on the stage as it is now, frankly, um, is probably unparalleled. I mean, of course, and and, and, and people. Try like, to I don't really think it. there's anybody else there, who, frankly, has was arrested in protesting, uh, you know, racial injustice. I don't think there was anybody else there. Um, you know, we're looking at this sort of lily white uh, and uh, short of Yang uh, experience. And I don't know what his experience was in terms of, of, of racial justice. But um, I mean, Bernie has that track record. I think he just needs to learn to express it in a way that is um, broader. And as Cornell West said, I don't uh, commitment is more important than the buzzwords. I agree. And, you know, and but, I think that but that's not necessarily for for. The um, the uh, uh, but again, he's winning. He's winning. I mean, well, he's got the best. Right. And, I agree. And, and I think and I want to just say again, just because we have to do this is just our public service. I mean, people who judge literally put out a list of fake endorsements. Joe Biden has been on the other side of actual civil rights policy questions, you know, so, you know, and and. Yeah, I, I won't include the other one, but it's just to me is I don't know why. I mean, we all know why Bernie always gets those questions. And the framing of that question tells you all you need to know about the political stance of the moderators and where they're coming from. They care way more about the politics of elite representation than they care about the worst effects of white supremacy and racial capitalism, which are material and can be measured in suffering and death. So maybe Bernie isn't always nuanced enough in the way he talks about this stuff, but you really cannot delink one thing from the other. And I think in general, his campaign has been very good about having an intersectional analysis that always centers class. Right. But I'm suggesting that, you know, that 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 there may be moments where centering class is probably not the most effective thing in in terms of what he's facing. I mean, I, you know, it's, I think that's uh, I understand there's a different agenda, but I'm interested in getting him elected. And um, and I think that, like, you, you know, you can you can. Making that small tweak, which I think is probably hard for him uh, because he's had a lifelong uh, commitment to that dynamic. 
but making a small rhetorical tw- uh, tweak. And he's certainly come a long way from where he was in 2016, without a doubt, I think is also it's still, um, you know, on the on the list of things to do thing. And some let's, of this recalibrates. Let's play general. this. I want to see this uh, clip of Van Jones uh, going after Warren on this. What is what is this? When you, when you, we just think purity tests. That resonates with me. Yeah. I do feel that there is something beginning to happen in the party where you've got to be pure on every issue. You've got to be above. And, and a lot of people start feeling left out and excluded by your kind of populism, which can sometimes sound elitist. Does that make sense to you? Says it. So now what Van Jones has said, and he's talking about purity tests, the idea that you won't meet with billionaires and millionaires in a wine cave. It's a little bit of that elitist. actually what he's saying? Yes. Because it was Maybe purity test that Pete Buttigieg phobic. came up with. The idea that you won't meet with them is a little bit elitist. Why do you think you're so much better than all of us? I mean, this is unbelievable when you think about like, and, and Van Jones, I'm sorry. Wow. Been not a fan for an extended period of time. Wow. Um, wow. I had him on once. In fact, I would encourage people to go back to that. I remember where I did it, did it in my basement I, it, back before we would even do any video. And I, I, I interviewed him and I just I, it, it was so stunning to me. He was starting a, uh, a movement to fight back against the um, uh, the Tea Party. And he was going to fight back about, the, you know, against like wealth inequality. I was like, Sounds so good. who who are who's responsible for this? Like, who is who is the enemy? I may have used those words or something to that effect. Like, oh, there isn't one. And I'm like, well, but I don't understand. Is this like, f- like the weather? Like, are you fighting against the weather? Like there's no, it was, it was completely, the whole thing was as if this stuff had happened passively. Like there was, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no power that is causing this. It's just like the weather. And we just need to build better umbrellas or something to that effect. That's um, right. All right. Let's we're we've got to wrap this up uh, for 2019. I'm going to read uh, uh, five IMs, 10 IMs, and then we will we'll wrap it up here. Uh, Hugo 420. Did Matthew film guy ever make the Cernovich documentary? Destiny called Michael a piece of shit over his Buttigieg criticism. Whoa. He's a star for attention, I think. Oh, wow. Well. I can imagine what he's going to say about me after today. Uh, Parliamentary Cricket Enthusiastic, a highly recommended reading on the history of impeachment in Britain. We've been doing uh, impeachment since the 14th century. That petulant child, Donald, really ought to be thankful. Removal from office over here used to involve the big burly man with a sharp axe. Uh, Connecticut Comrade, California local labor push. MR Crew, my friend has asked me to help publicize his push for two important pro-labor reforms to his assemblyman, Jesse Gabriel, for the 2020 California legislative agenda. My friend is DSA member, board of directors, a member of West Hills Neighborhood Council that is trying to push through two separate statutory amendments to California Labor Code. One is just cause, two is required salary range disclosures, all jobs posted online. He said he could really use more local support or DSA members at the meetings where he presents these pros. His Twitter handle is at time underscore progress. Boomer Sam, I need to spend my Christmas catching up in parks and rec so I can stay hip with the kids references these days. Why don't they uh, sell cliff notes on these darn shows? Happy holidays. Pseudolis, Sam, let's get pedantic about the calendar. Functionally, every time uh, keeping device in use today around the world uses the date representation that starts at year zero. Uh, ISO 861-01 is the international standard by every electronic device, every digital, bah, 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 I don't care. Come on, guys. Champagne communist. Samantha, have you ever heard about Spygate 2.0, <laughs> the new cheating scandal regarding the New England Patriots video? Shh, shut up. <laughs> Pitch ass road. Uh, <laughs> ben Shapiro is wrong. We don't want just abortion on demand. We also want abortion DVR. Uh, Jaliah. Hey, Sam. You have Now a- he's going to need to vote for Trump. Hey, Sam, you have big dick energy. Oh, thank you. Thank you for uh, <laughs> right here. Yeah, we need to go. We need to leave. Um, Chattius Stevens, a decade can be any 10 year span you want. Every passing moment is the end of a decade. Jay Shivone, best wishes to everyone in the studio for a healthy and happy new year. Also, I'm buying everyone an abortion. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks. And we will take, I'm going to take one final I am. 
of the year, ladies and gentlemen. We're actually getting gifted it. Thank you. Christo, by all means, debate Mr. July. How about Miranda July? Thanks for another great year. Happy holidays, MR. Left is best. Folks, thank you so much for everything in 2019. Michael, Jamie, Matt, Brendan, Josh. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, making this year so great uh, and all the support you've given this show. We will see you uh, in 2020. Um, uh, Michael has a show on Monday. Monday. Check out TMBS and, of course, uh, The Antifada. You can find it on Patreon. That's and right. And Literary Hangover. New up tomorrow. New tomorrow. So you check it out. We will be doing the AM Quickie every day, more or less, the, most of the days during vacation. So you can check that out at amquickie.com. We will be back live on January 2nd. Have a Merry Christmas. Have a Happy Hanukkah. Have a Happy New Year. Have a Solstice Day. Have a, uh, happy Holidays. All that stuff. See you next year. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught See the truth in the light bar Finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I get somewhere the choice was made for the option where you don't get paid For the road that bends before it finally breaks you I guess somehow I lost my drive 